got a license to talk. Shocking. Positively shocking. And the words are for your ears only. I think you got the point. Welcome to The Words Are Not Enough. In episode number 18 of The Words Are Not Enough, Carrie Fukunaga teases some early Bond 25 plot details. Could Richard Madden be lining up to don the tux in a post-Craig era? Secret Cinema has announced a new immersive Bond experience, and we pit Tomorrow Never Dies up against The World Is Not Enough for a Brosnan-era showdown. All this and more coming your way now. <laughs> what is up everyone and welcome back to the words are not enough this is our james bond talk show where we talk about the latest and greatest regarding our favorite super spy i am one of your hosts griffin 008 schiller and i am brody 005 Cervalli. there we go uh it's been a while since we've done one of these episodes am i right yeah. It has. It's been a minute. It's been a when minute. Was the last time we did one, right? Like back in September or something like that. Might have been. Might have been. That that. Yeah, I guess that does sound right. I feel like that's just like the structure of this show. It's like we do the intro and then we're like, yeah, it's been a while since we've done one of these episodes. Don't hate yeah. us, people. No, I mean, <laughs> I feel like if we didn't wait, we couldn't use that in the intro, and it would just really throw us off our game. Absolutely. It's all yeah. part of creating a formula. But um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, Brody, how are you doing? I know you're about to munch on some uh, Tim Tams. Yeah, I'm going to have a that. Have, if we have any Australian listeners, uh, they'll know the good the good taste of Tim Tam. I'm, I, I, of Tim Tam. I, I was going to I was going to have well, I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I won't I won't chew with my mouth open while I talk. Um, oh, please. Yeah. But other, other than that, I've been good. It's been a uh, it's been an interesting time because we just started a Twitter account for the uh, oh for the plug podcast. It. Oh plug yeah, it, man. oh yeah, baby. Plug that um, shit at Twain Pod. Uh, <laughs> the words aren't enough, like the acronym and Pod. T W A N E. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, pod and. That yeah, that's been fun. That's been a, an interesting experience. It gives me an outlet to talk about Bond. I don't even know if I'm going to have enough juice for this podcast. I think I've uh, I've exhausted, exhausted myself. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. We'll you've been uh, you've been going pretty crazy on there. I have to oh, say, we'll it's been. Oh, um, you have no idea for the like, you aren't prepared for the the shit posting that is to come. <laughs> oh, is there is there more to come? Are we getting like some some crazy stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, thank God. I got some gifts locked and loaded, ready to go. You got some <laughs> gifts? Whoa. I oh, thought yeah. you said gifts for gifts. a second. I was like, wow, Christmas time, and you're feeling really generous. Doing just a giveaway on the phone. Start giving out giveaways, man. <laughs> Please follow us. And then just like, hey, you know, maybe maybe that'll be something we do. We can give out some like James Bond Funko Pops or like oh my. digital codes for the movies. But then again, <laughs> why would we do that? Because if you're following the Twitter account, you should realistically own all the movies. But if you don't, that's fine. Um, it's the Funko Pops, on the other hand, I don't know if we would get away with giving those away because you would probably just keep them all. Well, I have <laughs> I have all the ones I really need, at least for right now, until the next wave comes out. The next wave, we're getting Brosnan, we're getting Craig, we're getting Jinx, unfortunately. It never um, ends. It definitely yeah, it just it yeah. never ends. Like, we're getting... Uh, blo- Are we getting a Blofeld? I don't remember. Didn't I don't remember all the ones... Named- it was a Dr. We- Evil. No, 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 we well, there's there's both now. Oh, we do have boy. a Blofeld, but it's the Donald Pleasance Blofeld, so I don't know if there's another what Blofeld they gonna, they we're gonna getting. Do Charles Gray Blofeld, please. Oh my God, <laughs> please no, no. The one that I'm really excited about is they're doing the Daniel Craig from Quantum of Solace with the uh, the AK or whatever the hell he has oh, in his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like from yeah, the he's got the assault rifle. Where he's walking over yeah. like, the, the, the granite or whatever the fuck is on the floor. Yeah, that's like, that's probably my favorite Craig pose. I have to admit. It's pretty great. I wish, like, yeah, it, it it is reminiscent of um, of like that 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 would be his pose, as compared to like uh, Sean Connery doing like holding the the wall throw up by his head or. Um, oh yeah, doing like the leg cross thing. Yeah, yeah, or Roger yeah, Roger yeah, Moore yeah. like raising his eyebrow and like yeah. doing the wide stance that he does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Oh, Actually, um, that's a great that's a great way to start off. What are what are the Bond poses? Because we've already gone through some of them. I don't know. Dalton's is like the the one on the cover of uh, the Living Daylights. I think that's the one, that's the one where he, when he's holding, he's holding the gun right up to him, up to his head. Yeah, and like yeah, yeah. That's a good one. I um, Brosnan has a similar one. I think Brosnan does have a very similar. One, the one where he's in front of the flames, and that's like pretty much yeah. like for the promotional stuff for Goldeneye. My oh go- my god, yeah. My yeah. go-to for the poses is either like either there's an iconic piece of promo art, 
or it's their gun barrel stance. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Because for George Lazenby, I think he has two. He has the kneel, obviously, his signature kneel. Yeah, the um, kneel. Or he also does, he has that one picture um, in London where he's sort of hanging off the, um, the like, the lamp. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's the one of, like, I think the, of. The in one front in of London. the Thames. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, with the lighter, right? The Is, does he have a lighter in his hand or something? Let me pull I think it he has up. He's a gun but, in um, his hand, right? Like, <laughs> I think I don't know. I've seen it as a lighter and I've seen it as a gun, but oh it's my, like some, some manipulations. Out no, there. no, 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 no. It is a gun. It yeah. just it's like so stubby. It looks like a lighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got his little wolf, uh, his, uh, his, little, <laughs> his little. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, that's that's God. definitely his iconic pose. But it's very similar to Connery. It's just he's he's not like the leg cross is a little different. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, he was definitely. Aping, um, oh, there we go with aping again. Um, oh, he your is definitely word of choice, right? he is yeah, of course. Uh, he is aping the Connery pose, I guess, because he's following on. Um, right. Also, right. this is like a complete tangent again. But remember how um, Roger Moore smoked cigars at the beginning of his run? Yes. Yeah. yeah. How strange is That's that? I wonder whatever yeah, happened yeah, yeah. to those. I feel like he stopped <clears throat> as time. Um, went on. Because Roger Moore, yeah. I think I think it was just because Roger Moore smokes cigars in real life, and he just sort of incorporated that into his uh, into the role. But then he just sort of phased it out over time. I don't know. Right? It's like, well, you know, uh, maybe, maybe is... Pierce Brosnan came along and punched him in the face for smoking. <laughs> Filthy <laughs> habit. <laughs> oh my That's my favorite thing, and we'll get to Tomorrow Never Dies a little bit later on. Oh, yeah. But I, I love that when he like offers the guy a light, then punches him in the face. He's like, "Filthy habit." Fantastic. <laughs> I like. That's oh. one of my favorite bits. Um, actually, yeah, he salts. Uh, two people for smoking in that movie. <laughs> Does he really? Yeah, don't, the, don't the, smoke around good old well, in, Pierce. In the opening scene, um, the one guy, the guy I, I, in the opening scene when he's like when he walks up to the guy in the snow, and he offers him a light or something. Yeah, this is the one I'm thinking of. Oh, yeah. well, he does it again in um at the in the right when he's he's going to Waylon's um like secret hideout, and oh, a guy, he assaults a guy for smoking. Well, no, he he pretends to offer a guy a light. And then he punches him in the face. Oh, okay. So that's I, that's interesting. That's like a trend in that film. It was a real anti-smoking like initiative in Tomorrow Never Yeah, Dies. I like how I, I <laughs> no for real. I love how I noticed the bag of cocaine in the safe, but I don't notice that. <laughs> like yeah, when it's like his signature <laughs> punching guys move. The bag oh, of cocaine yeah, yeah, yeah. is. I remember noticing that as a kid and like trying to figure out if it was um, Carver's or. Or Gupta's. <laughs> I like to think it's Carver's. De- that just that just makes me laugh a little more. He's, he's definitely on something. We'll, oh, we'll get to someone never dies up. later. We'll get to a name. Yes, later. yes, yes. There were, we have a whole <laughs> chunk, um, you know, uh, sectioned out for it, as we uh, kind of alluded to on our Twitter account. We put up a poll, and we're going to be uh, referring to that poll actually a little bit later on. You guys are really uh, interactive on it, so thank you for that. And we look to do more of those in the future, but. We got to start off with some Bond news. Not a whole lot, but little two bits and pieces here. And so we're going to go into Tomorrow Never Lies. Man, this whole mm. show is really just centered around the Brosnan era. Our whole, sh- I, yeah, uh, our whole show I, is just always very Brosnan. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it so much. It's phenomenal. Um, but anyways, so the first thing we're going to be uh, starting off with here is a little Bond 25 update. Nothing huge, but um, you know, it is only a matter of months before cameras begin rolling on Daniel Craig's final outing as James Bond. And And as expected, we're starting to get little nuggets of information along the way. So when director Danny Boyle was originally attached to the project, it was looking more and more as if Bond 25 would be a standalone film, not necessarily acknowledging the events of the past Craig era. Um, And it would be focusing on a self-contained narrative. Now, uh, Boyle's obviously off the project, and we have Kerry Fukunaga. So, speaking with Inquirer.net, current Bond 25 director Kerry Fukunaga uh, spoke a bit about how he plans to continue and conclude the journey Bond began back in Casino Royale. If I can find the quote here, I kind of lost it. There we go. (laughs) Uh, he (laughs) He says the following... In terms of what I can bring to change the character, Bond is on a character arc that started with Casino Royale, and I will be carrying that on. There will be changes, I am sure. 
As in any story, a character has to change in order to have a narrative. And that's not all we got from uh, Carrie here. Fukunaga even teased his progress on beginning to uh, plan the film's action set pieces, saying he's started to think about it a little bit, but not all yet. I'm trying to get all the narrative stuff sorted out and have a good story to tell. Fuganaga then went on to promise fans that there will definitely be elements of the 007 formula involved, saying, yeah, there will be things in the Bondverse that you have come to expect, he promised. I can't say too much, though. Um, and then I think we got like a few more quotes from him. The director also spoke a bit on working with Daniel Craig, saying that Daniel is an incredible actor outside of Bond. I have been a fan of his uh, fan of his work for years. For me, he was the best part of Road to Perdition. In his first Bond movie, Casino Royale, he brought an incredible amount of vulnerability and humanity to the character, which was a big shift from Pierce Brosnan's run. There's good old uh, Pierce being brought up again on this episode. (laughs) Um... But months ago, oh, it was shade. heavily rumored that... Are we throwing some shade? Do you think throwing he's throwing some shade? Some shade at some... Pierce, oh, like, like, <laughs> brought some vulnerability and humanity. He was acting unlike Pierce Brosnan. Like. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wouldn't dig that deep into uh, it, but... Um, I don't months think ago, maliciously, but... <laughs> right, 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 right. Months ago, it was heavily rumored that uh, Christoph Waltz would not be reprising his role as Blofeld in Bond 25, and to this, Fukunaga replied with the following, saying that... Who is saying these rumors? We haven't finished the screenplay, so there is no way that anyone can know that. If there is a space for Blofeld in the story, I would absolutely want him there. But I don't know yet what it's going to be. Uh, As of now, Bond 25 is still slated to release on February 14th, 2020. Brody, what do you make of these comments? I want to start by saying, ha, I told you so. I told everyone (laughs) so. I knew it. When with the, in regards to the Christoph Waltz, um, aspect of the story. Yes. um, Yes. Oh boy. Everyone was so keen to jump on, uh, Waltz, well, because Waltz made some comments about like, oh, I haven't been approached. I don't think I'm doing it. And everyone was like, right. well, that means he's not doing it. And I said, well, the script isn't done yet. And everyone, I, I got some pushback, but here we are. Here we are. And, <laughs> and, and like, here's my thing, right? Um, I'm not saying we're going to get Blofeld, but it is interesting that he's talking about it. And talking about because like I remember in, in the same interview he talked about Ben Wishore as well right, and uh, I believe so maybe a little bit yeah yeah and it was sort of the same kind of like sort of coy like well I'm sure he'll be back if we can get him, and um, which is like one of those things where like of course Q's gonna come back like and I don't, mm. I don't see why they wouldn't get Ben Wishore because it's, like, it's it's a it's a small part it's not like he can't make a schedule between Paddington movies. Um, and I, 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 the fact that Blofeld's being mentioned in the same like sort of way as like, a, a recurring character like Q makes me think they're definitely considering bringing him back, or at least at the very least considering tying up the story um, as it was left in Spectre, which is what I wanted them to do. Like, and I, mm-hmm. I mean, if, you, if you've been watching the show for a long time, I. I, I, I'm really. That's why it makes me so happy about that first comment he made about how he's continuing the story from Casino Royale. And the thing is, everyone's. I've seen some people complain that the Craig era has been too connected. Um, for me, that was never really an issue. I, I mean, the you read the books. I, I hate like you read the books, but to, I hate to be that guy. But well, we're gonna get to another person who's read the books a little bit later on as well. Well, right. And but the thing is, like it. it like if you read the books they're all pretty connected like not so much in terms of like a continuing story arc but there are references between books like uh, at the end of Casino Royale um Bond gets um spy carved into his hand and then he has to get a skin graft and then they mention that in the next in uh, in Live and Let Die that Mm -hmm. he had to have a skin graft on his hand to like so he could remain like you know um inconspicuous in the field um and then after diamonds are forever uh, he's in like a pretty serious relationship with tiffany case and then they have to bring up like what happened to that relationship in the next uh the next book um so there's always been like little nuggets of continuity in the books and they like this even in the films the earlier films are pretty well connected as well with like 
Spectre getting revenge for Dr. No and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, I think people uh, understate how connected the Connery films really are. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think, like, and I think people, like, I, by that same, like, by that same logic, it kind of annoys me that people complain about Craig's films being connected and saying that's a weakness. Like, yeah, there was some ham fisted stuff in Spectre, but. Realistically, though, that was the only film I thought where the the connection was so in your face, right? And, and that's the thing. I, I think I was like some people were saying, "Well, it was Spectre was trying to tie all these movies together unrealistically," but they were all pretty much tied together anyway. Like, mm-hmm. first of all, like there's an undeniable link between Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace, and mm-hmm. then Spectre's a little more loose on the connect. Oh, not Spectre, uh, Skyfall's a little more loose on the connections, but. Yeah, Skyfall is a pretty self-contained film. It is I pretty think. self-contained, but I think there is definitely like room for. I mean, that's another thing. Like people always say, like, like, oh, they jump from like really young Bond to really old Bond. But in terms of the timeline, there's only really there's, there's like a six year gap between Quantum of Solace and um, Skyfall, at mm-hmm, least mm-hmm. because Quantum of Solace takes place in 2006 because it's a direct sequel to Casino Royale, and two and then you have 2012 with. Uh, Skyfall. So I don't know if that was a big leap to say he's aged a lot being, you know, a, a government assassin over six years. I think that would age a man. Um, so I think yeah, it was like sure. definitely a continuity in his character arc, as Fukunaga sort of says, uh, between those films. Yeah, there's a bit of like some contrived connections in Spectre, but I don't think they should. Long, long story short. <laughs> I'm sorry for rambling, but um, I, I always maintained that it would be a mistake for bond 25 to just say you know what the connections and people weren't a fan of the way we use connections inspector let's drop that entirely especially for craig's last film like (laughs) why give up on the thing you've devoted so much energy and storytelling like sort of um capital on yeah yeah you you have to finish it you have to take it to its logical conclusion otherwise you're going to have craig's era is going to be this really lopsided weird like well they were all connected, and then there's Bond Twenty Five, and that one was kind of just on its own, you right? Know? Which and it would I, be I weird. Think I've kind of, yeah, I think I've kind of come around on that because I used to really not have an issue with Twenty Five being a standalone, kind of because I think I was soured by Spectre a little, mu- a, a little bit. Um, so when Danny Boyle was talking about it being a self-contained film, I'm like, great, just do whatever you can to like have Daniel Craig go out on a high note. But now I'm kind of retracting that a little bit. I, I'm seeing where Fukunaga is coming from. And if, if he clearly has a vision for where he wants to take this story, which it sounds like he does, and he sounds like he's figuring it out, um, yeah. and he respects, but I think that's my favorite thing, he respects the films that have come before it. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in Not just like Bond in general, but in terms of the Craig era he's clearly a fan of the franchise um you know commending uh Craig on his portrayal of Bond in Casino Royale and he wants to give it the proper conclusion so like I I I agree with you I do like that he's going to try and wrap everything up um from the Craig timeline because of how interconnected they really are yeah and I think that, that like as much shit as I like to give uh Purvis and Wade I think one upside to having them on board is that they are cognizant of everything that happened in the previous films because they were involved in yeah. all the previous films. And so, yeah, again, as much shit as I like to give them, and I do think they have their own uh, weaknesses as writers, for, at least for the Bond films, um, that is a, a, a nice, like, reassuring thing. It's like, okay, they're not going to completely forget everything that about Spectre because they wrote Spectre. You know what I mean? Or they're mm-hmm. not going to forget things that happened in Casino Royale because they wrote Casino Royale. So, I... Yeah, no, I I, I think this is really, really great stuff. Um, the whole interview, I think, if, if people haven't read it, go read yeah, it. because it's it'll, good. It's good. It's good. Uh, it'll make you feel a little bit better. I mean, if you don't know who Kari Fukunaga is, because, I mean, if you know who he is, that alone should excite you because if you, if you know what he's done with, like, True Detective, that should really like get you amped oh absolutely but if, yeah. you, if you aren't familiar with him and you like you have no reason to be excited about this random guy you've never heard of read the interview because he really does paint a really um good picture of himself as a candidate to make this film um yeah there, he I mean, has some should, really good comments a... about he has some really good comments about like a view to a kill I thought it was great. I was actually about to, I was actually about to bring that up. There, yeah. there should be a link to this whole article in the uh, in the notes for this episode that are in the description. But um, 
he, uh, you're right. He does talk about a view to a kill because I think that was like a Bond film that had like a really big impact on him. It because was the he first grew- one he saw. Yeah, yeah, and and he grew up in the Bay Area, and the conclusion of that film takes place in the Bay Area, and like he loved the Duran Duran Bond song. So it's like Hell the guy yeah. clearly has a, a, a an affection for this franchise, and and it's in the hands of someone who deeply cares about James Bond. And I think that's you, you don't want someone, um, you don't want anyone else. You want someone who you know cares about the franchise so someone who cares I, I like but that. also is willing to do something different and take Absolutely. risks and shake things up because again like i think there is a there is a tendency to like give it to someone who's going to be like who's going to treat it like like scripture you know what i mean someone yeah. who's going to be super like slavishly loyal to the formula that kind of thing i don't necessarily want that i want someone who's going to come along and say okay i love bond but we're going to do my own thing here. And that's... Yeah, for sure. Th- for, for me, for my money, I didn't know... I really didn't consider him before he was announced, but... I didn't I'm even think so about him either. Glad, yeah. I'm so glad he was picked. Like, I am so happy. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's I, really, yeah. really inspired... Uh, an inspired choice from... And since from, you uh, like... Since you like the one takes, um, that, that, like, especially the Sam Mendes' one take yes. from the opening, you're probably going to get a one take with Carrie Fukunaga because um, I, I mean, freaking hope so, man. <laughs> I mean, I freaking he hope did, so. He probably did the best one take I've ever seen on television. I haven't seen Daredevil um, season three yet. That's but, my favorite one take of all time. Um, but but True Detective has a phenomenal true. one take. It's incredible. Like my god. So I think. Um, Griffin, at least you shall be very happy with some of the decisions. Oh, I'll be he thrilled. Makes. Yeah, th- this oh. that's my thing. Is like I I'm a sucker for tracking shots. Um, I I, f- I think it really immerses you into the moment of what's going on and it adds more realism to it. So like we were t- we before the show started, we were talking about the opening of Spectre and like mm. while Spectre's oh, yeah, mixed bag. Yeah. yeah, that film opens with such a bang, not just from like a um you know action set standpoint, but from like a filmmaking standpoint. I I mean Hoyt Van Hoytema and uh, uh, Sam Mendes really just outdid themselves um, in that film, and especially Sam Mendes, at least for me, outdoing what he did at the beginning of Skyfall, which I think is a an adrenaline rush of an opening uh, that really concludes in in a, uh, in a in a very shocking way. I um, and mm-hmm. then um, you know you get something like Spectre with that one take and I mean you know people are just like oh it's just a one take nothing really happens but you gotta think about all the moving pieces going on there and how it just like really immerses you into what's going on it's just and and Thomas Newman's score at that moment which I I have been overly critical not overly I've just I've been adequately critical (laughs) of his score for Spectre because I think he's just reusing motifs I agree Skyfall I mean not even motifs Um, I think he's just reusing like tracks he's reusing (laughs) the the whole thing he's just like well we can use this here but I think his score yeah, like yeah. his score really shines at that opening. Um, it's a really good track, and I think like yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. It gives you a good sense of geography for the scene. Like yes, um, yes, it gives you a good sense of like where everything is, where the parade is heading, all that kind of stuff. So that when the action breaks out, you're like, you can just sort of soak in the atmosphere without having to yeah. be like, well, where are we? What's going on? Um, yeah, so I, I, I definitely think that it wasn't it wasn't just like st- like a a tracking shot for the sake of a tracking shot. It definitely serves a purpose film. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 Ab- yeah absolutely. Over, all, all round great stuff. Uh, wow. We really got off topic on that one, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, that's fine. The, the moral of the story is I'd love to see another tracking shot in 25 and with Carrie Fukunaga and his like, um, you know, inventive, not, maybe not inventiveness, but his creativity when it comes to crafting sequences, uh, I, I think we'll get, some incredible uh, uh, shots yeah. and and just you know sequences in general. But I hope I hope like in terms of like this is like a, uh, another little tangent before we move on about um, picking up where uh, the Craig sort of era story has gone like it left off. I mm-hmm. really hope they don't ignore the way Spectre ended. Like for a number oh, of with reasons, him and Madeline. With him and Madeline, not 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 because I want Madeline in the whole movie necessarily. Although if she is, that might be exciting to see um, sure. and like develop that relationship a bit more but more so there's the fact that Bond left the service you know what I mean I don't want I don't necessarily want to start the movie with oh Bond's back and that's all we're going to say about that I at least want them to yeah. acknowledge the fact that he quit at the end of Spectre and he like I mean like, yeah he ran off with this girl and so like you have to kind of 
I feel, I feel like you have to explain that, and I feel like, and yeah. I feel like that also could tie into the, the my favorite moment in Spectre, and I think I've mentioned this before, is um, the moment in Mister White's secret room at the Lamerican, and it's when Bond finds the uh, interrogation tape, Vesper's interrogation tape, mm-hmm. and he looks at it, and then like Madeline kind of notices and then he just throws it down and keeps doing what he's doing. But there's like a little pensive moment where you can see, because Craig is such a great actor, you can see like all of the emotion he feels in like sort of seeing that, that thing that he's sort of left behind, but you can tell he's not quite over. Um, yeah. Yeah. Despite like him saying he is. Um, well, I, I think that's, that's, that's a, something that's, that's been beautiful, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Such a beautiful thing. It's been so integral to Craig's take on Bond. And I yeah. think, you have a really nice opportunity now because you've got Bond in a relationship with the girl whose father pretty much destroyed Vespa's life. Um, and kind of ruined his life, too. And, and by extension, ruined his life. I think there's a lot of really interesting, dramatic potential there. Uh, oh, and, now, absolutely. and now you've got I, Bond having left the service prematurely. Maybe he's doing that because he's trying to, like... Uh, maybe he's trying too hard to move on when he hasn't really earned it you know what i mean and yeah that's true i i, I, I don't think, know i feel like there's a really it's a really cool place to end the to end that movie on and for the next movie to pick up and i hope they don't squander that and just say you know what whatever no he's, i he's back and madeline's gone and keep going yeah like yeah yeah no, no no i i agree i i think the best way to open 25 and this is I promise this won't. I, I won't go into too much detail, but I think the best <laughs> way to open Bond twenty five is with an incident that that draws him back into action, that like really propels him um, into action. Because I agree with you that he left the service. They can't just like gloss over that. That has to be something that is is a very you know integral part to him coming back to MI6 and 25 and so I feel like if you had something like a mm. you only live twice opening where uh there's like a, a, a so, some like global conflict event or, or, or yeah. something I I don't know that really like springboards him into action or like maybe, maybe he comes, <laughs> maybe he comes back because of Brexit <laughs> oh my god he's James he's like, Bond will stop Brexit England needs me and then he comes back <laughs> <laughs> oh my god no but, um either do that or have there be like a situation where um you know uh, like like uh, the beginning of the born supremacy where um his the love of his life is killed well not necessarily the love of his life but like the girl he's with is is killed and so right. he's kind of you know so you're, I, like, I, doing I, like a majesty's but at the beginning of the film yeah exactly exactly yeah. but that, that's why i thought of the born film because i was like our born supremacy because it was at the beginning but yeah no yeah, for sure I, absolutely i um i kind of am in the boat I, I used to be in a different position on this um i if they bring madeline back or at least they reference madeline um in any kind of way which i think you have to have reference her at least oh sure but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah i don't want her to be killed i used to be like oh yeah just redo the majesty's thing um Part of me, I, I, my evolution on that sort of uh, line of thought is, A, I don't really think it does any as any service to kill her off, um, because we do, I mean, like, I think most people admit we, we're not too attached to her. Um, no, no. And I don't think Bond is that attached to her either, so she, her death would just be... If they killed her at the beginning, um, then it really wouldn't serve that much of a dramatic purpose. It would just, be just sort of we, literally we, get rid of her, yeah. Exactly, because she was really underdeveloped in Spectre. So I feel like if Which they I kept her alive have, in 25, that gives us more chance to like connect with her, you know? For sure, yeah. But if, if, but if they do get rid of her, I think having them just part ways in like a like a Tiffany case kind of sense, or like a um, like from the novel, or um, mm-hmm. even like... I mean, maybe not quite the same extent, because of the way that book ends, but, um, Gala Brandt at the end of, um, Moonraker, they kind of part ways in an interesting fashion. Um, yeah. I think something like that where it's like mutual and cause I mean, Bond's got enough, uh, like, you know, sacrificial lambs on his conscience. I think it would be exploitative just to just kill her for no reason. Just like, well, we need to get rid of her. Um, yeah, for sure. 
And I also think it just wouldn't have the dramatic weight that Tracy's death had. Um, yep. And he would start the film off on a note where, like, well, it wasn't as good as Majesty's, and that's a really bad foot <laughs> to start off on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to start off comparing yourself to possibly the best Bond film. So, oh, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, or at least one of them, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, I, I just think... And then, of course, I mean, the, on a, a purely sort of... Um, on a different note, like, you know, fridging the girlfriend is kind of a done... Like an outdone Yeah, I, it's like, kind of... It's just, like, cliched and, like, yeah. it's just like, uh, whatever. Deadpool what, even kind of, did that a little bit in oh, the second Deadpool one. This, this is a big tangent. I don't, yeah, I don't want to, yeah. like, go off too much on this, but, like... <laughs> but I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think it's just... You know, it's just I kind mean, of like ugh, when really Deadpool did it, point. it was like it was sort of like, oh, that's kind of gross and unnecessary and kind of just weird and un- unsatisfactory. I mean, I actually, I, I don't mind Deadpool two. Um, I like it better than the first one, but that yeah, that was kind of weird. Um, <laughs> we get on Deadpool, oh, right? Yeah, I mean, but even like, I, I think uh, Mission Impossible Fallout did a really good job of um, resolving a relationship without. You know, torturing oh, the woman. Like you're right. You know they I mean? resolved it. They didn't just kill off. The, they didn't. They resolved the it, and they did it yeah. in a way that was emotionally satisfactory for the character. Yeah, for both characters, but also wasn't exploitative of the female character for the sake of drama. So yeah, yeah I yeah, think yeah. I obviously don't do exactly what they did because that would be plagiarism. But <laughs> plagiarism, you know, definitely uh, that, that would be something to be cognizant of. You say, you know, we, we can do. We, you know, it's it's going to be what twenty twenty. Let's do something yeah. a little more. Um, sure, just you know, you know, modern. Let, let's let's move away <laughs> from you know uh, genre cliches and whatnot, and just yeah. do something interesting. But, anyways, enough talk about Bond twenty five. Let's move on to who's going to be the Bond next 26. James Bond. Wow. Yes, this is a big one because we still are on this topic, and we will be on this topic up until um, the next one is announced. Until the end. Until the end of time. We'll until the end of dis- time. Always be discussing it. Yes. So, uh, is it possible that uh, Richard Madden could be the next Bond? Well, Game of Thrones alum and star of the new hit series The Bodyguard, Richard Madden, has been given uh, giving Bond bookies something to talk about recently as he's become one of the odds-on favorites to replace Daniel Craig as the next James Bond. Now, while as of today, November 30th, Madden was recently overtaken by Tom Hiddleston, whose odds are currently 5-4 to four compared to Madden's 2-1, to one, during an interview with GQ, the actor addressed the Bond rumors saying the following. My first reaction, says Madden, is always the same reaction, which is the papers make up a story on Sunday so they can discredit that story on Monday so they can sell papers on both days. This is what happens with all these shows, like Tom Hiddleston in The Night Manager. Then there's the next one. I'm the next one. Everyone just loves the rumor mill on that topic. I'm just the current one. There will be a different one next week. So when asked whether or not he wouldn't rule out the possibility, uh, Madden gave the uh, good old "I don't want to be the I don't want to be cursed" response. <laughs> so, <laughs> which uh, I, I I have to appreciate. He said, uh, "I don't want to curse anything by saying anything. I think that's the curse of that." If you don't talk about it, you'll curse. Or I'm sorry, if you if you talk about it, you'll curse it. Getting all tangled up in my words here. But mm-hmm. he then went on to state how he's a massive fan of the franchise. He loves all the films and he's read all of the books. And he has, this has been like a love of his since his early teens. Um, but it is interesting that some of Madden's co-stars uh, through past projects have even commented on the recent, recent casting rumors. We have Lily James, who was a co-star in Cinderella and Romeo and Juliet, say, uh, she said he'd be great it would be it would be great having a Scottish James Bond there's a cheekiness to him that works really well with Bond that wryness and glint behind his eyes you don't know what's going to come next mm. and then we have Kit Harrington, obviously co-star in Game of Thrones saying I don't want to curse him anytime anyone starts to get rumored for Bond it becomes a curse on them and the reason I don't want to do that is that I actually do think he'd make a very good Bond he's got that natural charm he's proven that he's proven with bodyguard that he has that muscle for it and wouldn't it be nice to go back to a Scottish Bond which I have to echo uh, yeah it'd be really cool to go back to a Scottish Bond let's do it but Brody it's interesting that this is the new um, 
that Madden has become the uh, the the new uh, fad, I guess, if you will, for yeah. Bond casting. Even though Tom Hiddleston uh, is ahead of him, he just surged ahead ever so slightly after uh, in the the Collider Avengers Infinity War screening, where the Russos did a, did a Q and A and they said that Loki is dead, and so a lot of people have been putting money on Tom Hiddleston because uh, you know. He's not returning as Loki, so might as well be James Bond, getting another franchise. So that's kind of why he surged ahead here. But I know you have been a fan of Richard Richard Madden for a long time, and yeah. uh, you have actually like you, you know uh, expressed interest in him taking on the role before. So how does it feel to be right that oh, he could man. potentially be the next James Bond? This is two stories in a row where I am right, baby. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I um no yeah I, this is fantastic. I mean yeah I, I've. For, for like to fill everyone in, I've I've been saying um, Richard Madden would be a fantastic Bond for a really long time. Uh, pretty basically since I saw uh, Game of Thrones, uh, like the first yeah. season. Now, um, have you um, mm, have you watched The Bodyguard yet? I have not watched The Bodyguard yet. Um, I want to. I probably when I have more time uh, over Christmas break, I might check it out. Um, gotcha. It looks really good. He looks really good in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is. And he, he, it's refreshing that he gave such an insight, like an insightful response with like the, um, you know, they're basically just rumoring me because I'm in a Bond like spy TV show, kind of like how mm-hmm. Tom Hiddleston was in The Night Manager, etc. Mm-hmm. Which is dead on exactly why he's being. Oh, rumored. it's absolutely. It doesn't yeah, mean yeah. he's not a pro. It's, it's the same reason why people talk about Henry Cavill. It's because he did uh, Man from Uncle and uh, Mission Impossible, where it's like, oh, he did two spy things, so I could definitely see him in a Bond thing. Mm-hmm. Um, again, doesn't mean he's inappropriate for the role because I think both of them are very, very good for the role. But that is the reason why people are talking about them, and that's the why. I mean, I mean, first of all, isn't Tom Hiddleston going back to the bookies thing for a second? Isn't Tom Hiddleston yeah. doing like a TV show, Loki TV show? Yeah, the, the, that's the only thing is so, he's like apparently he's supposed to be doing some Loki TV show, which I think is the yeah. dumbest idea in the world. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's not like he's going anywhere with the character, but I guess they're like, oh well, that's TV. He can do TV and film at the same time. So. I guess yeah. he can be Bond. I don't know. I, I mean, I've never, sure. j- just as a quick side here, I, I have never been uh, a fan of the Tom Hiddleston as James Bond casting. I just, I, I don't think he he carries himself. Like, in just in all the performances I've seen from him, I've never gotten like a, oh, he can carry himself as James Bond. He'd be a little too soft for me. Um, mm. I think he's an incredible actor and a great guy. I, I really do like Tom Hiddleston. I just don't like him for this particular role. That's fair. Yeah, no, I think um, with Tom Hiddleston, he'd definitely be more of a... Ah, see, I don't know. I think... Yeah, he doesn't. He definitely doesn't have, like, Daniel Craig's build or anything like that. Oh, no, no, no. Or, like, no, no. Yeah. So he wouldn't be, like, a Craig Connery kind of Bond. But, um... I mean, I could see it, maybe. I don't know. I haven't seen The Night Manager either. So I really... I've heard he's really good in that, and I've heard he's yeah, playing maybe. completely against type in that, which yeah. might change my, like my might my sway me a bit but based on everything I've, as I've seen yeah he definitely come, he'd be more of like a Roger Moore bond he'd definitely be more like sort of yeah but even like you know, I I don't know even Roger Moore could pull off some of the physical stuff in there that I don't know if Tom, I mean then again like Tom Hiddleston yeah. was pretty good in Kong Skull Island with like the action stuff so I I don't yeah, know maybe he could, no, maybe, he, maybe he could actually work out as he a good would just James be, bond. he'd just be a little, a little bit more uh, gentlemanly than he would be um, like super spy, which so, could be a nice change. Which of could pace be nice, yeah. But, but I, yeah, then I yeah. think Madden can do both. So I think exactly. Madden is um, he was always like back way back in the day before um we knew even like that, that Daniel Craig was coming back. Um, I always thought like I always had like in contention for the two people I wanted was was um, I, I wanted uh Michael Fassbender, of course. Or yeah. if they if they wanted someone younger, I think a younger version of a Michael Fassbender type Bond is Richard Madden. So mm. I, 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 like I just think, oh man, I, I'm, I'm just like not making any sense. I'm gushing, but he no. <laughs> would be very good. And I think he would be. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, like he, I think he has a better chance than Henry Cavill does because Henry Cavill's a bit tied up and also a bit older now. Yeah, um, unfortunately. Well, and that was going to be the yeah. next question I posed to you is like, obviously, 
People really like Madden. Um, they they think he would do a great job. Yes, I agree. The Scottish Bond would be great to have, uh, given Bond's ancestry. So that's kind of nice. Um, and also, yeah, it would just be it just be cool to have that. Um, but uh, between the two, if you had to choose, who would you prefer to be Bond? Would you prefer Madden or Cavill? Oh, it's hard. I think I'm gonna go Madden. I think really? Madden's around. He could be around. He's younger, so he could do it for longer. If they were to like make him go the distance, Man, I think. I, and I think like Henry Cavill is just. I don't know. I I, I think he's in terms of like his, this is getting really superficial because I think they're both they could both play it pretty well. I think. Um, I prefer Madden's body type. <laughs> like, wow, for, for that's Bond. a little shallow yeah. there. I mean, wow. yeah, I mean th- that's pretty much what it comes down to. Because I mean, I don't have enough evidence to really base anything substantive enough. Um, I, I can't make a, a decision of substance. Uh, that's fair on this, but yeah, I I'd be happy with both though. Absolutely, sure. I either one. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Either one, I'd be very happy with. For me personally, I would go with uh, Cavill. Just because I want to see him in that role, and like because I know he loves the character, and he has such, you know, he's wanted that role ever since it was taken or not taken from him, but ever since Daniel Craig like came in, uh, basically won over the producers. Uh, so like I just think it'd be like really fulfilling to see him finally get a chance to do that because I think he'd do a great job. Plus, oh, for sure, yeah. he doesn't always he doesn't usually get to play like a Brit, you know. Yeah. He, he's he's always putting on an American accent, so it would be kind of nice for him to just like do his uh, you know normal normal voice and stuff like that. I, I agree. Mm-hmm. I think both of them would be great. Cavill would definitely be more along the lines of a Craig. I think actually maybe maybe even more along the lines of a Brosnan. I think because he can pull off so like too. the physicality, he'd be, but he's smooth. Yeah. I think he's smooth. I think he. I mean, this is. I, I don't want to like take shots. I think Daniel Craig is a much better actor than. Henry Cavill. Like, I don't think that's taking shots. I think that's a that's a pretty accurate statement. Yeah, Dan- yeah. Daniel I mean, Craig is like a, the, a is a world class actor. He's he incredible. is. Yeah, and I think like and again I, that's what I mean. I, I don't want to make it sound like well Henry Cavill's a bad actor. He's just no, not he, as yeah. good of an actor as Daniel Craig. So I, I think he'd, he'd his his ability would be on par with someone like like Pierce Brosnan, who's a good actor, just not like. Not like that next level of like. Oh, don't complexity. you be taking shots at my buddy Pierce there. I'm He's, not. I'm just saying, like, in terms we're gonna of like, have an appreciation in terms hour of, for him. <laughs> I'm not taking shots at my boy no, Pierce. I know. But like, <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, if you, I mean, if you, if you, I think it's a, I think it's a self evident fact that Daniel Craig, Timothy Dalton, and Sean Connery are the three best actors to have played Bond. Regardless of what you think of their take, they are the yeah. three most accomplished and uh, well-rounded actors to have played the role. I would uh, agree. Yeah. Yep. And I think it shows because you look... Well, actually, I was about to say look at their career post and post-Bond, and or in, da- in the case of Daniel Craig, pre-Bond. Yeah. Um, but you look at Pierce Brosnan, Pierce Brosnan's had a pretty good career post-Bond. Actually, probably, I don't know if he has... Really, I, I, I think don't he's think had so. a very, I think, I think Timothy had Dalton's had a better post Bond career than Brosnan. Tim, Timothy like, Dalton's had a very good low key post Bond career, but like I mean, better than no career. I, I really, honestly, I, I Pierce Brosnan's done Mamma Mia, and that's like the biggest, that's the most high profile thing he's, he's done. He's great in those. And he is great them. in those, and I'm not, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not taking shots at Pierce. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> like it's it's absolutely. I, I don't know. I, I think. Across the board, I think he's been pretty low key. His his post Bond career, he had a pretty good like Durin Bond career, I guess, because he did a bunch of like blockbusters. Because he was popular yeah, at the like time. Tom, Thomas Crown Affair and uh, yeah, and like did like Dante's Peak. And Dante's stuff like Peak, that. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think Timothy Dalton's been like doing consistent work, like post Bond. And Sean Connery obviously has been doing consistent work until he retired. Well, he, but, um, right, until he retired. I I think uh, it'll be interesting. This is a little bit of a side here. I think when it's all said and done... The whole show is made of a side at this point. This whole <laughs> show is made of a side. Hopefully you're enjoying it, though. Um, <laughs> when it's all said and done, I think Daniel Craig will have the most accomplished career out of all of them. Absolutely, because yeah. he was Because um, he was a powerhouse before. He was just kind of not as well known. He was, he's a powerhouse during... And he's going to be a powerhouse after. He's just that caliber. Oh, of an I actor. think he's got an Oscar, and I think I think he'll have an Oscar on his mantle by the end of his career. Absolutely. Um, similar absolutely. to how Sean Connery got one later in his career. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, absolutely. That'll yeah. be 
something will keep keep your eyes on that space everyone keep, keep your keep your eyes on that craig kid he's got a great future <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he's got some talent oh, yeah, that, that kid that, that that craig kid over there no oh boy so, <laughs> anyways guys that's gonna do it for the news section tomorrow never lies let us know all your thoughts and opinions on the myriad of topics we've discussed during that segment in the oh, comment yeah. section of wherever you are watching and as always we're going to head into Q Branch. Now Q Branch is where we talk about all the little tidbits and pieces that don't pertain specifically to the films at hand. Um, so we're talking maybe like comics, video games, uh, special events, scores in this case. we got a lot of music. Um, so Brody, I'm going to hand the reins over to you. What do we got on the docket for Q Branch today? All right, we got some. Uh, we got some items. We got some items on the docket. Uh, we, some items. <laughs> we have well, first of all some news that dropped last night, um, which is Thursday night. If uh, depending on when this goes up, right? But, or or the the morning for you UK. Well, folks. yeah, true. It was in the morning. Te- yeah, I mean, it's, technically, it was in the morning. Uh, we were just up very late, but um, right. <laughs> it was. Uh, it, you probably saw, but there is a Casino Royale Secret Cinema event going on and so uh if you're not familiar with secret cinema uh and i'm gonna be honest i'm only vaguely familiar with what it is uh, uh, yeah i mean i, I hadn't i hadn't heard of it until i saw this yeah. announcement but it I, sounds I guess so cool it sounds incredible it's basically what they seem to do is it's like an immersive experience where they recreate the, the movie but you're in it Essentially, mm-hmm. and so it's a big long thing, and they take they take you from like location to location. You sort of watch the film unfold around you. It's like an interactive kind of thing. Um, it sounds incredible, and they, so they're doing one like they're doing a secret cinema for Casino Royale in London, and that just sounds so much like like so much fun. Like, what do you think, Griffin? What do you what do you think? No, I I'm a huge fan. I want to go to it myself. <laughs> Um, if I can, you know, find the time slash money. Next summer, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, it just, like, I I always love when they have these, like, super immersive experiences and, like, um, really make the films come to life. Uh, and, and, like, something like this. I mean, they literally, like, collect your phones at the beginning and then you're just thrown into this thing. You know, they, get, they give you costumes. At least it looked like they did. Um, they do. Uh, if you've done a secret cinema, please tell us about the experience. It sounds yeah, please. super cool. Um, I'd like to understand more. <laughs> yeah, for real. Because, I mean, when you go to their website, everything's, like, very vague. You have to, like, watch the videos in order to really get a grasp of what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, I mean, they take you from, like, Madagascar at the beginning to, like, uh, Montenegro. Uh, they give you, like, the drinks. They, they get, have, like, spies who are coming after you. Like, it just sounds like a really fun time. Um and uh, I I would I would kill to do it. Maybe maybe it'll happen. Maybe not. But um, if you are in the UK, seriously, go do this. This sounds incredible. Yeah. No. And so like if you, if you are interested in going, uh, I believe tickets go on sale next week. It, it's like um, it's like five yeah, it's days like from now. Five, or something. five like days December from now. Or something like that. December sixth. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, if you're in the area and you if you have um. I think it's like seventy nine pounds or a hundred US dollars. Yeah, um, that that's for the VIP, right? Or is that for regular? No, that's for the standard. It's like between. I think they said between forty and seventy nine pounds. I don't know what that means, but um, gotcha. for like the standard package, and it's a little more expensive if you want to do like the the lavish VIP one, where you get like I think it's just you basically get some VIP access, you get a fast track entry, and. Um, like drink vouchers and food vouchers and gift. Which like gift come bag. on, if you're doing a bond experience, you got to have those drink vouchers. Yeah. So here I, I pulled it up. Um. So yeah, it is forty to seventy nine pounds for the standard package, and then for the VIP, it's one hundred and twenty five to one hundred and seventy five pounds. Um. And the big difference between them is it's a four hour experience for both. Um. Yeah, but if the additional, uh, yeah, drinks, fast track, that kind of thing, gift bag. Um, but yeah, no, if, you, if you're sinking money into it, you might as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, go, but yeah, go no, it out, sounds great. It's, it sounds like a really, it's interesting that they chose Casino Royale. Um, it'd be, you'd think it'd almost be easier if they just done, they'd just done Skyfall since half of it takes place in London. But um, That's true, yeah. I like that they did Casino Royale. It's the... It's, in my opinion, it's the better film, but <laughs> right, yeah, and, it is, and it is, like, I think I, you can definitely do something more exotic with it because you got like, you know, casinos and whatever else locations um, and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, um, 
well, not casinos, just the, just the one, but um, just the one, just the one casino. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know it sounds like a fantastic thing. There's really not too much else to say about that right now. Um, funny story though, I I saw on Twitter that there was going to be like a, a Bond story dropping, and we were originally going to record this a day before, uh, but then we heard about this this Bond story that's coming, and so we thought, okay, we'll we'll hold off and we'll record it the next day today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. And then it turned out that this was the story, uh, which, I mean, I'm glad we got to talk about it, but it's not exactly worth pausing the whole show for. Oh, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, kinda, it's, kinda it's just a cool little thing, but it's, yeah. Yeah, no, um, I mean, you've probably already heard about it if, you've, if you're if you on Twitter or on Reddit or something like that. But, yeah, um, if you're, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much that. Uh, the other big piece of Bond, like, Bond news that we got this week uh, was the announcement in like the opening for pre-order for the uh the world is not an- i nearly said the words i nearly said the words i know the, the word <laughs> fuck i just said it again um, the world the world <laughs> the world the world the world there we go this show the is really is not fucked enough. up our, 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 our like uh i can't even you know, appreciate the title of that film anymore the world um, is not enough the Bond's I know. family motto yeah. but yeah no it's like the world is not enough expanded score by david arnold has uh our Lord and Savior, David Arnold. Our Lord and Savior, the great divine composer, uh, David <laughs> Arnold, who has forsaken us. Um, but yeah, so he, they uh, through La La Land Records, they are releasing an expanded version of his score for The World Is Not Enough. They'd done a previous one for Die Another Day a couple months mm-hmm. ago uh, that was pretty popular, pretty well received. It was uh, excellently done. I, I did buy that, and it's uh, well worth the film, or well worth the money. And I, yeah. I did... Uh, I did pre-order the, um, not even pre-order. I just ordered the uh, the the score for expanded score for the world is not enough. So I'm I'm really really looking forward to that because that's one of my favorite David Arnold scores. And out of the, out mm. of the Brosnan era, I think it's probably my second favorite score. Yeah, no, for me too. It's like I yeah. I, I really I, mean, I don't know. I, I I get tossed up. Like he's, his work is so consistently good. Oh, that it's excellent. Yeah, it's sort of like picking uh, your favorite child, but. I, I mean, first of all, I, I think Tomorrow Never Dies is his best score, and I'm hoping this means I agree. that we're going to like slowly progress back and get a Tomorrow Never Dies expanded score. Please. Um, <laughs> yeah, please, because, I mean, I kind of have one. I actually don't even remember how I got my hands on it. I think it's like a, it's like a, it was like a, like a studio recording or something. I found it like forever ago on some forum and hmm. uh, downloaded that, and that's been kind of like my companion because it has like, expanded versions of all the scores but i'd like to buy a legitimate version of that um Same. because it is such yeah. a fantastic score but going back to the world the world is not enough god damn it um, <laughs> going back to the world is not enough expanded score uh, there are some really really great tracks what are the what, what, what tracks are you most excited to see uh on this expanded version of the score griffin since oh you were man uh, i'm chomping at the bit for it honestly i'm really excited <laughs> to hear the uh the demo the world is not enough demo um oh, yeah. that david arnold put together cuz i i don't know if i've ever that's ever been released or if like i or no it hasn't been released it's a previously unreleased track so i'm like really no. curious to hear um you know the original ideas going on there uh honestly i am just stoked out of my mind for the complete recordings of that intro because <laughs> uh, i have made it very very clear that the opening to the world is not enough is one of my favorite openings of a bond film um of all time it's basically, if not it's my basically two openings stitched together so <laughs> it, 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 right it, and it works for me it, it really does uh and and especially the gun barrel dude oh God, that is what that is one of the best gun barrel walkout sequences, I think, mm-hmm. too. So, uh, yeah, I am thoroughly uh, looking forward to all of this. I mean, yeah, I could go into a little bit more detail into like specific tracks, but uh, I think yeah. it's going to be amazing. Um, I've got some I've got a couple of tracks uh, that oh, I'm yeah, looking forward for to. I have um, Bond has left the building, which is yeah, that was the, 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 yeah. the, the track where Bond jumps out the window. I have wanted a nice version of that for forever yeah. um it's brilliant I, I think i've said this on the podcast before but the world is not enough is my first bond film and i have the most vivid memory of bond jumping out the window uh like in um bill bow and I, yeah that, that, that's like that score is like what i think of when i think of bond and like pierce Brosnan sort of like 
rappelling down the side of the building. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And so yeah, th- 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 just for sentimental reasons, I really want to hear that track. It's also a really good rendition of the Bond theme. Um, mm-hmm. I've also got. Um, I'm also really looking forward to another like sort of very very small track really. Um, at the end of the scene, at the end of the movie, which is um, I think it's only a couple seconds long. From is yeah, it's, it's called it? Sub Gets It. Yeah, yeah, which is basically the little track that plays after Submarine uh, on the original score, um, mm. but it's not on the score. Where Bond and Christmas Jones eject themselves uh, through the torpedo tube. Yeah, um, that little like yeah, just like the, the the climax of that is so good. I don't know why it was never included on submarine it seems to make makes sense to me. Yeah. i guess there's already a bit of a climax to that track and so um they probably couldn't have included it but uh, the um the other two sorry i just thought of two more that oh, i'm actually really it. looking forward to are the extended version of the caviar factory oh yeah with, because that's i think that's one of the best sequences in the entire film and then the uh the pipeline the full like oh mix pipeline, of the pipeline yeah classic. yeah yeah, great that's stuff. like a fan favorite track yeah yeah i um another track i'm looking forward to is uh i will because you hear hints of it in the actual score, uh, in the, the original release of the score. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a little motif, like, um, I guess it's like the the plutonium slash Renard track. I think it's Devil's Breath on this uh, release. Yeah. It's like the little dun, 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 dun. You know the one? Oh, um, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah it's very yeah, subtle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I really like that. And actually, in fact, this is a weird, like, uh, another aside, another tangent, but um, there's a very similar sounding track in the soundtrack for the first Uncharted video game, Drake's Fortune. Um, mm. And it plays like when you're in the, the submarine pen and all the deformed like zombie creatures are like attacking you. And well, right before that like, you get attacked, it's like slowly building up. And I always just noticed those tracks were like very similar. Mm-hmm. And... For that reason, I think it's sort of stuck with me. So whenever I hear it in the movie, I'm like, ah, oh, that's a banging track. Uh, it's very slow. So maybe not banging, but sure. <laughs> um, it's a good track. Uh, yeah, no, this is a great this is a great soundtrack and a really, really cool um, idea. I hope they, after they do Tomorrow Never Dies, I hope they do some of uh, his Craig films. I'd love to see Quantum of Solace expanded. Oh my God, um, please expand Quantum of Solace. Because the, uh, the Casino Royale one is actually surprisingly expanded like it's pretty beefed up yeah it's pretty beefed up so i mean we would realistically only be looking at a few tracks here and there for that one but dear lord happy to get but yeah yeah but dear lord the quantum of solace one oh and then his bond 25 score hopefully gets an extended expended right uh, of course because he's <laughs> coming back we we can confirm that must, david arnold is coming back for must bond live 25. in uh well, this, wasn't there a tweet that you saw that like, there was a tweet? He someone was asking about him coming back or, or to score the next Bond film. And he said something very cryptic. I don't remember what it was, but uh, wasn't it? Like, didn't he say something about like uh, like because he mentioned the world is not enough being his big thing, his big like announcement? And someone said, "Are you sure that's your big announcement?" And then he's like, "Well, I've got a couple of other ones up my sleeve." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. That Which, sounds right. He could be talking about his new uh, project, uh, Good Omens, but. He, oh right! In the context, in the context of like a Bond thread, it does sort of seem to be hinting at maybe he's not quite done. Um, God, I would I hope, hope he's not. not. I hope. Eventually I feel like get I one. feel like good old Carrie's gonna, gonna bring him back on. He he understands that man's value and worth. Exactly. Finally, someone who does. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, no. So that's a great little thing, and I think it. Uh, yeah, you can pre-order it right now. And then it goes on sale and starts shipping out, I guess, December 3rd or something like that. Um, sometime early December, anyway. Some next. point. It'll yeah, ship next. out at some point. But, um, yeah, so check that out. And now our last story in uh, Q Branch is kind of just a little like tidbit, little fun fact. Um, Griffin, I actually think you know more of the backstory behind this than I do. Honestly, um, I don't. I just saw it. There was a... Um, there's a so the Tomorrow Never Dies video game uh, soundtrack, the beloved. yeah, <laughs> the beloved, the beloved Tomorrow Never uh, Dies video game. Um, yeah, unfortunately, not a lot of people really revere that game. I don't think because it followed up uh, GoldenEye, which yeah. was just a massive freaking hit. Like even people who didn't like like James Bond just played that game because of how much fun it was. Um, mm-hmm. But it's interesting because. 
on the soundtrack for the game, there is a uh, second theme referenced as Tomorrow Never Dies 2. Um, so mm. in the uh, and this is in the game's opening music credits credits. Uh, and the track was apparently officially titled Letter to Paris. Um, Which is a good name in, for a track. Right. It's a great, great name for the track in the, the video game soundtrack. Uh, but the song is actually never heard in the game. Um, although apparently the the developers like coded stuff for it, so it exists, but it just isn't used, um, yeah. and it's only featured on the official soundtrack as a bonus hidden track. Uh, it was written by the game's composer Tommy uh, Tallarico, or yeah, Tallarico, and is performed by Elaine Pava. It's about two minutes and forty seven seconds, and according to MI6, uh, the the home of James Bond, 007 News. Uh, it is one of the rarest Bond songs, and so there's a... And um, it's not very good. It's not very good. <laughs> I, it, it, it really is quite dull, and I, I'm just... Not that I'm disappointed, because this is just something I didn't even know existed, so I was just yeah. like, oh, okay, cool. Um, but for those of you who enjoy you know, a little bit of... Um, Bond rarities. This is this could be one for you to check. Yeah, and if, out. And if it, you like the sound of like a, a of a woman singing underwater, then right, maybe right. this is for you. If you're a big fan yeah. of um, Fury Eyes Only's like like the 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 Sheena Easton song, yes, yes, maybe check that out. Maybe, maybe give this one a listen. But uh, <laughs> yeah, as someone who's not a fan of that Bond song, I was thoroughly unimpressed so yeah. but it is interesting that they're uh you know you, you get little tidbits of this stuff here and there but anyways that's about it in terms of that song hell yeah and that, that brings us to the end of q branch boom there we go boom, and done. uh as always guys be sure Not to let us know your thoughts and opinions on the Topics we discussed during Q Branch in the comment yes, section. Of please wherever. yell at me about Deadpool 2. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, well, that was in the news section. We're talking Q Branch here. Well, okay, uh, let's yell, know me, yell at me about Secret Cinema then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You must yell at me um, about something in every section. It's a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a requirement to yell at Brody. Um, one one quick thing I do want to note: the uh, the limited edition two CD set for the World Is Not Enough. It's gonna be it's gonna run you about uh, twenty nine ninety eight in US dollars. Plus and, six dollars uh, for shipping. Plus, yeah, six dollars for shipping. There, there's like a, I think about like five thousand units or so. So uh, get your hands on that while you still can. They're starting to ship them out soon. I got my tracking info, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but as always, guys, that's going to do it for Q Branch, and we're going to move into our discussion segment, the one you've all been waiting for. Shaken, but heard now i'm gonna actually let brody take the reins on this one a little bit because he's prompted this entire thing and a lot ah, of the yes. topics we're gonna discuss have really come up uh just through like the the bond films we've chosen to watch as of late for whatever reason uh, i know brody you put up a couple polls on twitter which i'm sure we'll get to but yeah. um brosnan the brosnan era uh the the two films in the middle of his era that kind of get glossed over and kind of are considered to be the same really aren't the same are they they're very it's, it's, it's really interesting actually because like um this seems to be a uh, running like a bit of a meme among bond fans um it, so much so that even pierce brosnan kind of played into it um in uh, the everything or nothing documentary he sort of just said oh they all sort of run together after goldeneye um <laughs> Uh, when he was talking about his experience, and then he, and then he obviously very viv- vividly remembers Dino the Day because they made him um, like surf on a like a fucking iceberg. Oh but, yeah, hands <laughs> down, the worst moment in a Bond film. Truly, ever. truly exceptionally bad. But um, maybe not, maybe not as bad as the really bad effects of Blofeld's laser and Diamonds Are Forever. Um, eh, gives it a run for its money. It's yeah. pretty pretty rough. But pretty rough. yeah, no, uh, there is a bit of a uh, of a of a sentiment that the world is not enough and tomorrow never dies are basically interchangeable, kind of unremarkable um, middling entries in the series. So I put a poll up because I've been, I've been uh, engaging people on Twitter at Engagement. Twain Pod. <laughs> Twain Pod. <laughs> um, Go give us Twitter. a follow again. Go give us a follow uh, if you want to be engaged with. But uh, yeah, I, I put up a poll basically just saying if you had to pick one of the two middle Brosnan films, which is the best. Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough. And it was pretty divided, to be honest. Um, especially for, for the longest time, it was pretty 
pretty split, but people came out in favor of Tomorrow Never Dies, which yes. is something I endorse. I believe that Tomorrow Never Dies is the better of the two, and in fact, I think it is actually pretty good. I watched it last night after the poll um, because I was just in. The, I was in a bit of a Brosnan mood after all this Brosnan talk, and honestly, yeah, I I, I don't understand a lot of people's issues with this film like it's, it's yeah. not as good as goldeneye obviously no, no um no. and there are some like kind of hokey bits in there but not not in a way that i think is unacceptable for a bond film i think you know like there's always gonna be some little like little goofy moments there's even goofy moments in goldeneye like no, sure, yeah. Yes, I honestly don't know what people were expecting when well, they saw I, this. I think it's it's interesting <laughs> because I, you know, I what prompted this discussion was I went back and I wanted to watch The World Is Not Enough because yeah. for whatever reason, that's my comfort food when I don't know what to watch. And it's very, very odd. I don't know why. It's not like I, I didn't necessarily grow up watching that film the most out of Bond films, but I've just become very attached to it for whatever reason i i quite enjoy it even yeah. despite its um convoluted and and mixed nature which i will admit it it does have uh its fair share of issues but um so we watched that and i was talking about you know like oh gosh i love this one and then you were talking about how cuz i think you watched tomorrow never dies recently and then watched it again correct well i watched it okay so this is the thing i watched it um oh, this would have been over it was like the a summer. couple months ago yeah it was that's over what the it was. summer yeah, yeah. yeah and i watched it and we were talking a bit about how... Um, okay, so this is a little fun fact that I found out. that Because um, I mentioned to Griffin, I said, wow, the Tomorrow Never Dies is actually a really nice-looking film. Oh, it's incredibly um, well shot. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I was just saying, like, this, this movie's really much better looking than it has any right to be, um, <laughs> considering it's just like a, a, a big blockbuster action movie from the 90s. Yeah. Uh, they weren't exactly known for it being like artistically expressive back then. But... Then I looked into it, and I, I can't believe I didn't know this, but uh, the, the, the cinematographer for the movie is actually um, Robert Ellswit, who um, is the cinematographer for um, the, There Will Be Blood and a bunch of other, like, Paul Thomas Anderson movies. Mm-hmm. And he's done, a, I think he's basically done all of George Clooney's movies. He's won, like, um, he's been in, like, nominated for Oscars and BAFTAs and Independent Spirit Awards mm-hmm. and, um, like, really accomplished a career and so i was kind of blown away that he just did a bond movie and that no one talks about it because we always talk about um yeah. like obviously roger deakins and obviously um hoyt van Hotima with the, the, the most recent two but yeah i i think it's a gorgeous looking film and so anyway i initially brought this up and i said hey isn't it weird how tomorrow never dies it has a really cinematic like really nice looking film and then the world is not enough kind of looks like it was shot on a sound stage yeah it's um, a little glo- it's a glossier uh you can feel i feel like you can feel what's well, interesting if you go through the progression of the brazen films the like golden eye definitely feels like it could be a timothy dalton film especially mm-hmm. in it's like grimy aesthetic and it, it definitely feels like still like the remnants of the cold war because that's when it was taking place and then you move on to tomorrow never dies where it looks like we're finally entering the modern age um they, they, there's definitely, I, at least I feel there's more money behind it. And then plus there's, uh, you know, the cinematographer who's just excellent. And then you move on to the world is not enough where it's like they put even more money into it and we're entering the early two thousands and it kind of has that aesthetic to it. And then we get to die another day, which Jesus Christ. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even, they, they like went full on MTV on with that one. It is very overproduced. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like they dumped too much money into it and they just had to show how much money they dumped into it. Well, that's the thing though. I think it almost like the more, cause I, I actually, I disagree. I think they don't, I think they, they begin to look cheaper. I think you well, they do look cheaper, Golden but I think it's because Tomorrow they're Never doing dies more look ex, they're, like, they look like expensive films. Just the way they're shot. You really see every cent. I think, Tomorrow, uh, the world is not enough, but more so, Dying of the Day look very cheap. Um, and I think, but they're but not I'll cheap what, films, obviously. But just something about them is very amateurish in terms of the, their aesthetic. I think it's because they're dealing with 
new like like millennial technology that was emerging at the time they really wanted to like try and push the boundaries in terms of that stuff because that, that's kind of what they were doing with uh, with die another day as, as as awful as a lot of those cg sequences look in there at the time it was kind of cutting edge stuff you know like like no one was necessarily doing stuff like that other than star wars and george lucas is always on the brink of that sort of thing so no one's ever going to match that level so i i think weirdly enough i think at the time it looked pretty bad though i don't know but i I I don't know i I don't remember it too much but but even in terms of but you're right in terms of a bond film i think they were definitely pushing the envelope because there really was no cgi in the previous bond films right and Um, and so i think like the world is not enough and die another day from a production standpoint um and even cinematography standpoint was a little more experimental um i don't know about experimental though i think i think like i I think they look i when i say they look cheap i don't mean like oh they didn't actually spend any money on these old like the set pieces look bad because i mean give them all the shit you want they look like like, all the all the action stuff all that is very very well oh absolutely highly produced very very top-notch stuff um i just mean more in terms of like the way the film is lit the way the film is shot um, and I, well, I, and that, this, is, this is kind of what I was tying into um, when I was discussing, like, when I initially watched it, my, my sort of, when I was juxtaposing them. Uh, so you have Tomorrow Never Dies, which was directed by uh, Roger Spottiswood, and he, I mean, not, not, not the most, like, well-known director of all time, but he is definitely a director. He's a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think him t- teamed up with um, uh, Elswip, sort of give the movie a very it, it's very steeped in cinematic language um i mean yeah, as all the bond it, films are but it looks like you know you've got a lot of like shallow depth of feel yeah uh, field you've got a lot of like sort of the the, the i mentioned it before as well on twitter that i'm gonna keep plugging this freaking twitter but um that i would love a james cameron bond film and re-watching this last night I kind of feel like we may have got it already with this movie. A little um, bit. Uh, you in, could also refer to like, True Lies as the... <laughs> <laughs> right, as yeah. The, I mean, yeah. Um, that's uh, that, that definitely was his stab at doing a, a film like that. But in terms of, like, Tomorrow Never Dies has, has a very, like, James Cameron aesthetic. And what I mean by that is, like, in terms of, like, 90s action movies, his were the best looking, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least they very much defined, this, like, the aesthetic. And Tomorrow Never Dies definitely follows in that, like, trend of you've got a lot of, like, sort of, uh, like, the floodlights with the, um, like, a bit of the lens flare with the high, uh, the, 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 the dense blacks and, like, the, like, the contrasting colors. Oh, yeah. And, like, everything about the way is the film is lit and shot just feels a bit like It's, that. like, 90s um, action. Yeah, for Yeah, sure. but, it, but not in a cheap way. It doesn't feel like a no, Van Damme movie. No, 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 it's not, movie. it's it not feels, like a superficial, like... Like, a, m- like a James Cameron movie, you know what I mean? Yeah, like it's, it's, yeah. It's got some... It's got some filmmaking credentials behind it. Uh, whereas The Wall is Not Enough um, is directed by uh, Michael Apted, who is a very accomplished documentary maker. He did the Up series, if you're familiar with those. Uh, and uh, he's, he's more steeped in, in documentary filmmaking. And I kind of feel like that shows in the way tomorrow, The Wall is Not Enough is shot. Um, we're really going into the weeds here, by the way. Um, sorry if you're tuning out. But uh, yeah, it, it's kind of shot in a way that he shot for coverage because as a documentarian, he kind of would assemble his films in the edit and you sort of don't have a scripted um, material to work with. So you but, just, yeah. you yeah. shoot everything and then you put it together later on. And that's kind of how I feel like the world is not enough is shot. It's shot with um, like, there's a lot of exposure, like, like in terms of lighting, because you've got to, just in case something happens, you've got to have high exposure. Um, a, a lot of like sort of, um, uh, the, the, the field is very, very, like, narrow, oh, not narrow, wide. Um, I don't know, it, 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 it makes it look less cinematic to my eyes, in any case. Um, the camera's a little more sort of just plonk down and just follow the action, whereas there was some interesting sort of camera movements in the world, in Tomorrow Never Dies, but um, that's just the filmmaking stuff. Don't want to get too bogged down in that. Um, but I've, I've always thought that Tomorrow Never Dies was just more of a film film than... The wall is not enough in terms of like a the in terms the, of the craft craft yeah yeah no 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 yeah. I agree with you especially after rewatching Tomorrow Never Dies recently uh, well rewatching both films but um dude it, there are some it's, cool it's shots in like, the, Tomorrow Never Dies like all the shots of like Elliot Carver's eyes with the reflection of the screen oh it's, it's brilliant yeah it's yeah dope, it's great stuff dope. oh my god <laughs> I I think I think what it is is like you've got the two films in the middle here and each one is like 
they're they're very much like the end of the '90s, but like one is leaning a little bit more towards like the Golden Eye kind of thing with Tomorrow Never Dies because it feels because or I'm sorry, with, yeah, with Tomorrow Never Dies because Tomorrow Never Dies feels like the logical progression from Golden Eye, just a little bit nicer, I guess, because Golden Eye is a very like uh, dirty and grimy looking film. Um, mm-hmm. n- not saying that it's it's a bad looking film. It just no, it's a very uh, nice looking film. It, yeah, it feels it looks more like one of the Dalton era films. No, yeah, no, you're right. It has like like, like it's yeah. kind of just like a grimy kind of feel to it. Um, right. The, the the blacks are kind of crushed. That kind of thing. Right. Like, and so Tomorrow yeah. Never Dies uh, cleans it up a little bit, but it's still kind of like it's still a grounded film. Um, it's still it, I I still feel like that movie could take place like in the real world. And whereas like you get to the world is not enough where. It's kind of in the same line, but it's like definitely leaning more towards like the uh, the die another day end of it and the early two thousands end of it. They they definitely um, you know try and go super uh, big with it with um, you know Electra and they kind of delve back into the Roger Moore silliness a little bit. Actually, that was the one thing I noticed upon rewatching was because mm-hmm. um, I've always loved the world is not enough. And I'm not the biggest fan of the Roger Moore era. Love the man. I appreciate what he did. It's just I I don't. Those aren't the films mm. I necessarily go back to the most. Um, but in the world is not enough. Brosnan is. I mean, he's very much his own. He's he's yeah. being kind of uh, you know the Brosnan Brosnan Bond we all know and love. But the, but the movie has so many elements of a Roger Moore film. And I think you were talking to this a little bit. It, it's almost like a, a tonal mismatch of what's going on because the film's trying to be very serious in the subject mm-hmm. matter and what it's talking i mean everything with electra is dealing with like um what, what, like what is stockholm that? Uh, syndrome yeah, and, stockholm yeah, syndrome yeah. um and and abuse and you know she has her like family issues and whatnot like and so it's compelling character stuff but i think the way it's approached in some of the elements in there specifically like I'll use this as an example, like the flying skis, like the 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 the, um, the oh, snowmobiles the, um, the pa- with the, the parachutes, the, the hawks. which is a totally yeah. silly design, which reminds me of something that would come out of the Moore era. Um, it's like when you when you have elements like that, and then like um, who's that the the gold teeth dude who's oh, like literally Mr. The, Bullion yes the, who is literally the mm. worst henchman like <laughs> ever I mean I, I don't even know what the heck he is he looked like he stepped out all, out of the set of like a um, uh, like an MTV music video I guess which just proves my point that Die Another Day really made the full transition into MTV territory but yeah. <laughs> um, I mean he's he's like wacky out there a little bit um there are, you know, to some extent, like I, as much as I love the, uh, the 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 factory sequence with the helicopter with the blades, like th- that's totally like super spy fantasy spy type stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, no, no, for no sure. one in real life is gonna have a helicopter with giant chainsaw blades hanging from it. And so it's like these little things Which that is really fun. stand it, out. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, it's, it's it's great. I I love. It just contrasts a bit awkwardly yeah. with all the very serious character drama stuff. Exactly, and so and, and yeah. so that kind of goes back to the word "world is not enough" being a little bit of a mixed bag. It's like trying to, you know, cover both territories. Whereas when you look at something like "Tomorrow," "Tomorrow Never Dies," which I think the biggest fault of "Tomorrow Never Dies" is that it's just very middle of the road. It's very flat. It doesn't See, dive I know, deep. I, I don't into know the if themes. I, I don't know if I buy that though, because I mean, I think it dives deep into its ideas as much as any I think other it's unremarkable. prior it, it, it's, Bond film. Like, yeah, I, I, I just think, and, and, and like, it's got like standout set pieces. I don't know what about it could be seen as unremarkable. You know what I mean? Like, you, we, we had another poll about um, car, car, like like gadget laden car chases. Um, yeah. And the winner of that one was, in fact, uh, and I happen to agree with this, the uh, remote control car from uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. Oh, absolutely. It was very close with the Lotus. It was, like, neck and neck. Um, But I think that's a a standout scene and probably the best use of, like, a gadget-laden car that we've ever gotten in terms of, like, the application of the gadgets. Like, we got to see all the gadgets do more than one thing multiple times, and it all sort of tied together really nicely. For a nice little sequence, um, but like that's a standout moment. You've got uh, Elliot Carver just eating the scenery. Yeah, I mean he's a. Ha- I mean he's definitely my biggest problem with Elliot Carver is 
he's so stereotypical Bond villain, but like at the same time, Jonathan Price knows that he's a stereotypical Bond villain, so he really plays into it and makes the character better than he would be otherwise, um, or more right, delicious, if I may, uh, than he would yeah, be exactly. otherwise. But but once again, going back to how I think Tomorrow Never Dies is just such a surface level movie, they don't necessarily give him the depth I w- that you would get in a character like Elektra. Um, even Wei Lin, who. I really enjoyed the fact that there, there were two government agencies working together to, uh, you know, accomplish a task that was going to affect both of their governments. I really liked that integration, but at the same time, she feels a little bit pointless other than, you know, to have the two Bond girl staple, which was a staple of the Brazen era. I would have much preferred Paris be in the film the entire time because I love Terry Hatcher in the film. <laughs> um, and even aside from that, I would have um, rather Paris be Natalia, which would have been a great way to link in Goldman. Yeah, we've just you sort know? Of discussed a bit of that before. Yeah, it's like, right, um, right. I think, I don't know, I think I don't think Waylon's any more disposable or useless than... Like any of the other times we've done uh, this same sort of World War Three plot, with um, like you have uh, Kissy Suzuki in You Don't Live Twice, and you have um, Anya in uh, The Spy Who Loved Me. I think yeah. they're both I mean, just as integral to the plot. I and mean, like the idea is that, that you have the Chinese and the Amer- and the British being pitted against each other, so you kind of need. A representative from China so it's not just like Bond saves the world again like on his right. own I don't know I feel like that adds it adds something it's not necessary but nothing is necessary really no in I mean that, and that's true like, and she's she's definitely not as bad as like say Christmas Jones who is definitely mm. abysmal but what I will say about Christmas Jones and we talked about this a little bit was I don't think she's a poorly written character she's completely unnecessary and I would have much rather just had her not be in the film and focus solely on the relationship between Elektra and Bond because I think that's some par- powerful stuff going on there um I just think that it's Denise Richards who completely blows up the character and makes her right. worse than I she mean, really is. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, and that's the thing. She was definitely written as a smarter character than she ends up coming across as just based on the performance. But, right. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't give them props for writing it well but not delivering it well. It was kind no, of... I, I, she I kind of that. ruins I, oh, the... And then she yeah. does have some kind of weird lines as well. So, like, um, I mean, again, we're not, like... I'm not being too harsh on her... She, whatever um i'm not gonna lose sleep over the fact that christmas jones is in a movie but um yeah. and, and i think I, I in terms of s- waylon actually got like some action and like she got to do some stuff no she and, definitely did i mean she's she is definitely useful. she's the prototypical like bond meets his match kind of bond girl but she's definitely better than jinx like <laughs> oh my god yeah jinx is an abysmal character as well unfortunately um but yeah, no, it, it's just, and, and I, I definitely don't think Wei Lin is a bad character. She just comes across as unnecessary in the film. Um, is she more, and, and is she more really unnecessary a- than any of the other Bond girls? Like, really? I just don't think that's. A, I don't think that's a real worthwhile yeah. criticism. You know what I mean? Like, and I that's how I feel is. like. What about this movie is disposable? Maybe maybe it didn't like grab you, but I don't think it's like a forgettable film. I think. Well, I, I think the pl- it, I think it's just a very cl- more I think so it's than just, the world is not enough. You know. Like, well, I I think more so than the world is not enough. Uh, it's just a very it's a very paint by numbers Bond film. Even though it does pose some very interesting themes, and I think it's incredibly it maybe not incredibly well. Yeah, I'll say incredibly. It's an incredibly yeah, well made film. Um, and uh, the opening is excellent. I, mm-hmm. The opening, the white, the whole White Knight opening is very edge of your seat, tense stuff. Oh, it's one it of my features. Yeah. It features Pierce and what is my favorite uh, outfit of his, which is that yeah. leather jacket with the Ooh, fucking yeah. slick hair and everything, filthy habit. Oh, I love that so much. Um, but yeah, no, I. I there's a lot to the movie that I like. I mean, you know, the, we talked about the pacing. I think the pacing is excellent. Oh, I think it's one of the, the best movie, paced Bond movies. It just, I agree. It just moves. by. You just, it just, you, you start, right. and then, I mean, especially for a plot like this where you're doing like, you know, building up on the brink of war kind of thing. Um, uh, I, it just, it just zips along. You never feel like, oh, they're wasting time here. Like you feel like no, there's it, urgency to everything that's going on. Um, and I think sure. I mentioned this before. Uh, I think. In terms of, if you're going to do the big World War Three plot, I think of all the different times that Bond has done this, this is the time, the one time that it felt like war was legitimately going to be imminent. And if Bond and Waylon don't act now, uh, regardless of whether or not they stop Elliot, these two countries are going to go to war. And yeah. it, you, I and think the- it, it helps where you, like, they're in the ocean and the Navy and the, the, uh, the Air Force are like approaching each other and there's like this sort of... 
uh, ticking clock. I don't know. It, it felt way more effective. Like it, the movie does very much have a ticking clock feel to it. Yeah, which like, I, like which when, I when do you watch like. the Spy Who Loved Me, which again is a fantastic film and probably a better film than this overall. Um, but when you watch it, you never really think like, oh well, if if they don't. I mean, maybe it's a bad example uh, because. The, the goal there wasn't so much war as it was like mutually assured destruction. But um, right. when you I mean, watch like You Don't Live Twice, you never really think like, well, America and China will be at war if Bond doesn't do this. Like, obviously, that's that's a, it's the, definitely more cartoony. The, whereas, like, this is yeah, yeah. Well, right, not, not even like cartoony. It's like the implication is there, and you understand it intellectually that oh, they're, if Bond fails, then there's World War Three. But there's never really like a, a tangible example of this is going to happen. And I, right. to its credit, Tomorrow Never Dies really gives you that like, if Bond and Waylon fail, we, 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 you're watching the Navy and they're going to open fire. And you, you, kinda, you know it's not going to happen because it's a Bond film, but there's like mm-hmm. a little part of you where it's like, this is intense. Like, it's, oh, I sure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really well executed. Um, and I know some people have a, an issue with it repeating that same plot, but... I don't know. I think it did a pretty good job with it. It did a good job updating it. I think it, it just... I, no, I and I agree. It, we, given the the cliche nature of the World War Three Bond plot, this... Um, it it did it well. Like, it's it's a serviceable film. I, I And I think it's a good film, even. Yeah. I, I just think it's unremarkable uh, because it doesn't really... It, it poses a lot of interesting questions, especially in terms of, like, you know, uh, media, uh, you know, uh, and and all that stuff, and people who run the media. Um, actually, mm-hmm. a lot of topics that are very relevant today, and in fact, I would say that this film is better today oh, than it was so back well, then yeah. because of how relevant it is. Um, the fake news bond. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so I think my my biggest problem is is they have these really unique set pieces and these interesting this interesting commentary on the media, and they just kind of play it safe with it. They never dive too deep into like Carver's motivations. He's just he's just a you know um, a power hungry media mogul who wants uh, to. But, but here's well, the thing, like. Yeah. I, but I think in terms, I think like in terms of if we're going to dive into the commentary of the film again, we're going to get into the weeds. But um, I, I don't know if it needs to be that complex. I think the idea it doesn't of, need to be, I mean, but it doesn't it's, need to be. But I, I, I don't think it necessarily harms the commentary that the film is making or the point it's trying to make, if any point at all. But um, I think like the idea that someone would st- start a war for money. Is a pretty is a pretty a, a relevant and not so far fetched of an idea, especially when it comes to the media. Like, not even like like obviously this is an extreme because it's a Bond film. We're taking it to like the extreme of he's going to start a war and he's you know mm-hmm. going to kill people. But the idea that the media is more interested in profit than it is in um, any kind of like you know kind of journalistic integrity in terms of you know presenting the facts and not putting its thumb on the scale, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like that's a really interesting point. Like, the idea that profit is more important than, f- like, truth um, is a very real concern. And I As agree. someone who studies this stuff, it's like, it, it, I feel like it's yeah. a very, that's a very, very like, real thing. And then the movie presents it in a way that's like, obviously it's a heightened version of that because it's a Bond film. But yeah. um, I don't think Elliot's motivations needed to be any more complex than he's a rich guy and he wants to be richer. And right. He wants to, I, I just feel he, like he will he... use his platform to exploit the situation to enrich himself and to like basically monopolize the market. I right, think that's well, a really I... good, good Bond motivation, good Bond villain motivation that I don't think we needed to know like, oh, he has like a tortured backstory. I think his relationship with Paris is, I wish they had probably like, continued that a little bit further into like the second act but um that is one of like the things when like oh, she's she'd... killed off very fast she's killed thing. off and then like no one really mentions her again um and i i, I would be nice if they sort of brought that up again and invoked that uh but jonathan price plays that scene really well where he's like very conflicted about the uh, he's conflicted but he's not deterred he is uh going to kill his wife and I, I, that little moment where you sort of just see him with the really eerie music and he's sitting in in the um in the broadcast room, in like in mm. the situation room, um, and he's just sort of sitting there with the lights reflecting off of his face, and I think that's really good. And I like it was enough depth where, depth where I'm like, this is an actual character, but not so much depth that like is like oh, I distracted from the fact that this is a Bond film. It's a kind of a fun, light-hearted Bond film. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it, I think it does exactly what it's 
designed to do perfectly. Um, it's, it does. It, it, I just, I, yeah, I, I would have liked it more so to than have... the world is not enough. I think the world is not enough. Tries to juggle too. Many, it, it's more ambitious, but it juggles so many balls, and it it gets really messy in the right. middle there. And yeah, that's I admire the, and it's, the, it's. It's. I admire it's. Uh, it trying to strive to be a bit more. I just think it took on too much. Kind of like Spectre a little bit. A little <laughs> bit. Yeah, I think World is yeah. Not Enough did it better personally. Um, there's my hot take of the day. Uh, no. so, <laughs> I don't know if that's a hot take. I think they're both pretty unpopular films in the canon and I, I think people true. probably prefer World is Not Enough. Um, I, I think the difference between the two is where Tomorrow Never Dies was a little too cliched and played it safe and I, I get what you're saying about Carver and whatnot. I, I still think that he's just very... He he real realistically is a just stereotypical Bond villain, but there is potential for him to be more than that. And I just would have liked mm. more of that. And then I also and then I still I like I, I do understand what you're saying, that the that the the commentary is there. I just don't think it was I, I just still think it's it's all very surface level when the film I think has a little bit more interesting things to say, but that's that's what I'm going to say about that. Uh, I don't know. About yeah, that. I know yeah, that's yeah. fine. We're but, never um, going to agree on it, you <laughs> bastard. So uh, you know, we're, um, in terms of the world is not enough. Um, I think that you're I think right. It's just as cliched as Tomorrow Never Dies. If it is. I, I'm not road. saying like, it's right. Yeah, I'm not saying I, it's not a cliched so film. I mean, it, it does try to do ambitious things, but I think everything that you're saying is wrong with Tomorrow Never Dies is also wrong with World Is Not Enough. And then I see. I see. But I think like, the characters <laughs> in the World Is Not Enough are more. Uh, there's more to them. I mean, maybe not like Renard is is very much stereotypical terrorist, but at least Electra, who is really the key component there. Uh, and I agree um, that Electra is more complex than Elliot Carver or anything like that. Um, right. Or, or even um, either Waylon or Paris. But I don't know. I, I Again, I, I like The World Is Not Enough. I don't think I don't think there's a big degree of difference between the two movies. It's very is marginal. It is very marginal. Yeah. Um, I just think The World the Sword of Never Dies is cleaner. But yeah, continue your point. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, no, no. You're fine. Yeah, I I think, um, and we were talking about this a little bit, I think as a film, Tomorrow Never Dies is probably the better film. It's a little more, like, it's tighter, it's more focused, um, and it the, the pacing is excellent, whereas opposed to The World Not Enough, there is plenty of moments that just kind of drag a little bit, despite the fact that I enjoy it. Um, and so mm-hmm. I think from a filmmaking perspective, going back to that, Tomorrow Never Dies definitely is the better made film. But... In terms of characters um, and interesting, uh, just interesting things they do with characters, I think that the world are not en- is not enough. Definitely outdoes Tomorrow Never Dies. Now they definitely ter- <laughs> they, they telegraph Electra and they telegraph that whole thing, which is whatever. But I think I mean as a um, kid it blew me away. I mean I didn't expect of course. it, but um, yeah. but I mean we we can't overlook like Valentine's Redemption. Um, I think that's an excellent way to tie up a character that was introduced in Goldeneye, uh, mm-hmm. and it pays off for me. And I, I think from an action set piece point of view, uh, I think the world is not enough has better action set pieces. Uh, see, but I don't know. I, don't, I, I again, I, I don't want to like say, oh, I'm right and you're wrong, because obviously it's a matter of opinion. Yeah. Um, I think the action... Well, I think the action in Tomorrow Never Dies, I think because it's shot better, it just... I, I I get into it more. Like that's fair. Yeah, I really like I really like the the, the concept of the um the caviar factory, and I think it's a actually it, it's a good scene. I'm not, oh, I'm not saying lo- like the whole. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying the world's not enough is shot like trash or anything. It's it's still competently made. Um, mm-hmm. but I, something like um. I don't know something like the 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 Hong Kong bike shop. Fight yeah, that bike is chase way is more yeah. like riveting to me than that, just because of the way it's shot and the, the energy of it. And I mean, it helps that um, uh, Michelle Yeoh is doing the stuff. Oh, she's and you excellent. Can see yeah. her doing it. And she's incredible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I and then going back to your thing because uh, you sort of said your biggest disappointment with Elliot is that he is ha- he has a ton of potential, but it never really pays off. Mm-hmm. See, for me, I feel like they never really set him up to be anything more than he's a villain. He's got some interesting, like, sort of plot details to him, especially, like, in retrospect. Um, all that media stuff is interesting. Um, 
Well, you're, cable, and you're the cable and you're news right. stuff. Yeah, but you're right. I think, but, he's, but I think the, I think tomorrow never. Do, sorry, I, I think the world is not enough. Sets up more interesting stuff again because it's so ambitious. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it fully pays off on a lot of it. Like not in a way that's like because yeah they they do uh, posit these more interesting versions of the characters. Like Bond is definitely more conflicted in this movie than he is in Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah, at least he's presented to be that way. But at the end of the day, I don't think he ever really like fulfills that promise neither does i mean electra a little bit but at the end of the day she still becomes a cackling evil woman who runs up the stairs taunting bond you know what i mean like i i think there are there are definitely more shades to to her as a character and there's definitely more shades to bond as a character but i don't think it's like that much deeper i don't think they fully commit to a lot of these ideas in in the same way that like they eventually would in like the the craig era um, right. Well, again, I mean, that, the you, you not, could say that for for both films, I think. But you could definitely um, say that for both films. But I think the difference is, the world is not enough is trying to do that, and I don't think Tomorrow Never Dies is. So I don't think Tomorrow Never Dies. I, I, I don't know if I can fault Tomorrow Never Dies for not being deeper because it's not really trying to be. Whereas the world is not enough is very obviously trying to be, and it never really quite reaches that level. It's still deeper than Tomorrow Never Dies, but it's still not quite as deep as I think it wants to be. Well, and I think uh, it really utilizes it M well as as well. Like, she definitely has more of an integral role in, like, the guilt that she's kind of carrying throughout the for entire sure, film. For sure, yeah. And I mean, there, like, again, like there's, there's interesting stuff in there, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, and I like it. It just... I, that's just me. I mean, I, I can't tell you you're wrong. But, um, well, and, and yeah. I, I am agreeing with you. I think Tomorrow Never Dies is the better film from a, a, from a, a filmmaking and even storytelling perspective. I just think that the the tomorrow never dies kind of stays at, at like a very at like a flat line the entire time it doesn't really go to it doesn't dip too low it doesn't dip too high whereas like the world is not enough to me when it the the stuff it really hits that are high are some of the peak bras and stuff but for every one of those there is one that kind of dips down and so yeah it's definitely more inconsistent but i think i just appreciate it for having something more interesting to stay than just being a, a, a you know just like a kind of straightforward and uh, uh, for yeah, lack of a better I mean, I words, forgettable it, film because i, I, I do think for tomorrow never dies is a little is pretty forgettable i don't know if the world's not enough does have anything more to say though i think I don't know. Well, I'm not but, saying like st- like super deep, con- like subtextually. I'm just talking about in terms of like character. But even in terms um, of character stuff, writing. I think I think there's there's more there. But I don't think it. I think in terms of subtext, of Tomorrow Never Dies, whether intentional or not, has way more to say. It does, um, but it doesn't so it makes go it, anywhere with it though. That's but it does the thing. though. It kind of takes it to its uh, logical conclusion. Um, I don't know. Also, this is a fun fact about Tomorrow Never Dies. Since we're like, uh, I, I was sort of surprised by the caliber of talent behind the film. Um, uh-huh. st- obviously, um, initially with the cinematographer um, Robert Ellswith, uh, Ellswit. But um, also, did like, for for the Star Trek fans in our um, in our audience, if there are any, uh, apparently it was co written by Nicholas Meyer, who uh, did like Wrath of Khan and Undiscovered Country, and mm-hmm. like pretty much all the good um, original series like star trek movies mm-hmm. um but yeah he was he's an uncredited co-writer which i didn't realize it just blows my mind how yeah. many people were involved with this movie yeah um, yeah no i i um i mean tomorrow it's it's a great like i said i i i am agreeing with you i think tomorrow never dies <laughs> is the better film i just i i think <laughs> oh, i, I, mean, think I wasn't that, saying that to like one up you or anything no i know you're <laughs> just pulling out like, no, well he done. wrote wrath of god so it's a better yeah, yeah. film so fuck you no um right no 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 yeah no, not to one up you uh just but that just is like one extra tidbit i wanted to get out real quick <laughs> no 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 for sure um I mean, you know, we can we can compare certain things. For instance, here, um, like uh, let's start with the openings. I think the world is not enough has the most incredible opening out of the Brosnan era. Ah, uh, well, okay, that opening in Golden Eye is pretty incredible. And actually, oh, yeah. yeah, it has. Okay, I think well, there's a cooler stunt in the world is not enough's opening uh, compared to Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah, but I think Tomorrow Never Dies again, like like the whole film is just tighter. It's t- it's opening scene sets up. Um, the Admiralty, which is going to play a role in the rest of the film, it sets up uh, like Henry Gupta. It sets up all of this, like all this stuff that's going to be relevant later, without being directly tied, like the, the the encoder, that sort of stuff. Yeah, but it's also a fun little action scene with a really cool, like special effect. And um, 
Again, the walls not enough is really cool, but it's kind of a bloated opening scene. It's really good, but it's really long too. Man, like I said, it's two scenes it basically like that. stitched I'm together. It blo- it, I'm not well, dissing it. Maybe bloated is the wrong word. It, the bloated bloated is the wrong word. It is it is jam packed. There you go. I think it's it exhilarating, and it is I exhilarating. think it's, it's one very, of my favorite. Scene. It's one of oh, my sure. favorite David Arnold uh, scored sequences. I think the mm. only thing that tops it truthfully is for point. me is um <laughs> uh african rundown in casino royale which is just oh perfect that, that is, is an incredible track that is an incredible chase that is the greatest chase in the bond series so <laughs> uh go ahead fight me on that one but Whoa. for me i think the world is not enough takes the cake in terms of opening i love that and plus it's a boat chase how often do we get to see boat chases in a bond film that's so fucking cool you know what I was actually thinking when I was doing that uh, that Twitter poll about the um, the gadget laden cars? Yeah. I almost included the the Q boat as like a gadget laden vehicle because it is basically it is, a gadget yeah. like gadget car, except it's a boat. Um, but then it even drives on land, so who knows? Right. Um, well, yeah, no, you're, you're right. It is a really good scene. I um, I mean, like, I'm not gonna say one's shit and one's good. They're both very good. I think I just I like. How how much how hard the Tomorrow Never Dies scene is working to set up the rest of the movie? No, um, and yeah, I get it. Yeah. It's all you, right, and also just like I, I, nothing, I, nothing beats that like, um, the when he flies out of the explosion is and then oh, yeah. after and then when he ejects the guy into the other vehicle, he's like, tell the admiral, ask the admiral where he wants his bombs delivered, and like it's just like, <laughs> yeah. the most shit eating line ever. Oh, it's it's great. Like I <laughs> I think um in terms of tomorrow never dies, like the. I, well, I mean, we'll we'll go to David Arnold's score. I think David Arnold's score is like what, what was it? We were talking about the the um, the climax, and actually, that's the next thing I want to get ah, to. Yes. I know we're kind of scatterbrained all over the place here, of but course, the, yeah. the climax for both films. We're not I always think, like this, I swear. Right, right, right. <laughs> I think we agreed that the world is not enough is probably a better climax, but the Tomorrow Never Dies one fucks really hard. Yes. Like it is like like James Bond, Pierce Brosnan becomes a straight up John Woo action hero, mm-hmm. and it's a little it, it kind of dips a little too much into that 90s action but once again the whole film had been a 90s action sequence so it didn't bother me really yeah but the score for that climax man is david arnold unchained he is a madman during that it's unbelievable un- yeah unbelievable <laughs> no you, it, it, that's the thing that that whole score is unbelievable it's like like there's leaving it all on the field and then there's david arnold's score to tomorrow never dies <laughs> because legitimately you can tell he's you can tell he's always wanted to make a bond film score and yeah you can also tell that he thinks this is his only chance and so he's getting yeah, it all so out leaves. there yeah, yeah i think um in, in terms of the it, every track no, yeah fucks. yeah like, it's, just, it's so oh exhilarating like uh the one that you're talking about that i um well obviously the climax is great um oh, and man. uh it, it it is really just the culmination of the entire score david arnold is just blowing his load for lack of a better uh, term but very um, vulgar this right this is episode. a very vulgar episode <laughs> in terms of talking about scores blowing his load <laughs> but um the one that you uh pointed out to me that I, I i hadn't really listened to in some time was the the hamburg escape yes um, which, which is um which actually that entire sequence is really really good the where, oh he, where he's escaping the the newspaper facility Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is the thing. So, like, I don't know if this was on... uh, I I don't know if this was on the official... Because, again, I I mentioned earlier, I have this, like, sort of, like, studio recording thing I found on a forum, like, a decade ago. Yeah. Um, So, it's, like, really expanded. But for Hamburg Escape, it has the entire, like, Bond escaping the facility. And then it has that really great acoustic, like, um, like, James Bond theme that plays as he's like walking through the um the reams of paper yeah and yeah. then it plays like the the dunnans, dunnans, as he like rolls out on the little trolley and rolls out of the thing and then the little track that plays as he's driving to the hotel room and he's on the phone with Elliot that yeah. whole sequence the music for that is probably the best rendition of the James Bond theme that has ever been committed to film yeah. or to like any kind of audiophile um <laughs> it's unbelievable and that's part of the reason why I want a an expanded um like Tomorrow Never Dies yeah. like, soundtrack what, what I was going to say was that, like 
he uses the James Bond theme so liberally in this movie. It's everywhere. It's like excellent. Every 10 seconds. Yeah. And it's so nice. Like, because there's another really good rendition of it in the finale when uh, when he's dual wielding the guns. Which is, oh, and, it's so ridiculous, but it's great. It's over the top. And, um, but yeah, there's a really great version of it there. There's a really great version of it during the bike chase. It's just, it's Bike everywhere. chase it's is excellent. So yeah. Good. yeah. And that's another great, great action scene. Um, yeah. Oh my God. And then, like, them jumping over the... How can you not like the action scenes in this movie more? How can you like the movie... Uh, sorry, how can you like the action scenes in Tomorrow Never Die? The world's not enough, sorry, more than this movie. Like, they, when they jump over the um, the building <laughs> the, on the banner, like, unbelievable. <laughs> so good. But, um, well, I think, okay, I, I look at the action scenes in The World Is Not Enough. Um, I think the weakest one is definitely the, the snow chase, because I think that's probably one of my least favorite uh, Bond snow chases, to be honest with you, because it's just a yeah, little no, too... Yeah, I agree with that. It's yeah. a little too cartoony. Um, it's not a bad action sequence. It's fine, uh, but it's not it's good. It's, just, it's, just, it's just all right, yeah. yeah. I th- it kind of I mean, comes him, out of nowhere, and yeah. Right. The best action sequence in the entire film is definitely the opening, and so I think you can make an argument for saying the world is not enough blows its load a little too early. Um, <laughs> <laughs> common theme here about loads. Um, oh, wow. And, and I, I really love the transition into the main Bond song for both films, I, I, I have to say. Um, mm-hmm. Like with the jet kind of breaking the glass and then going into Tomorrow Never Dies, and then with yeah. Bond hanging on the... Uh, uh, the Millennium Dome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, that yeah. was um, also really, really well done. Um, what are the other action scenes? Oh, the uh, the the pipeline sequence. I love the pipeline sequence in the world. It is really enough. good. Yeah, it is no, it is really, really, really it's a lot well of fun. done. And I like like Bond sort of having to make a decision under duress. That's like a, a fun little moment. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, going back to what we were saying before about um. The which finale is more is better because we did have an interesting discussion about that. Yeah, we uh, did. Because I agree. I think I, I love the Tomorrow Never Dies better, and I think the finale for Tomorrow Never Dies is fantastic. But oh, and it it's great sort of, when, especially it, when Elliot meets his end. I think that's a great. It's oh, such a fitting. Yeah. And that's another great version of the Bond theme when he's like walking up and he like machine guns the guys in the control room as he's like just yeah. walking up classic Brosnan while you um, just before we move forward here I do want yeah. to take a second here and say that speaking of Brosnan killing people that's a topic we're gonna get into just like a, after we we finish up like comparing the two films because Brosnan is low-key one of the coldest bonds in the entire series mm-hmm. I think he's definitely he's definitely got a bloodlust oh my much. god he loves but, um, shooting people point blank he loves, in the face. he loves machine guns he's like he's got yeah, a fetish for he machine really guns. does <laughs> but um yeah no like I think the finale for like it, it kind of veers into like one man army territory which is fine but in, it's in never really which, which film tomorrow never dies tomorrow never dies yeah, yeah. In, in that like and which is fine but that is more of like an action cliche more so than it is a bond trope because bond is never i mean the, the classic blonde fina- bond finale is bond and an army of guys raiding a base you know what i mean uh right. so bond has never really been the one-man army type of action hero um he's done it a couple times obviously but it's been most notably in Tomorrow Never Dies. But for me, I always sort of prefer, um, and it is done well here, but I always sort of prefer Bond like having more of a, feeling less invincible. And when he versus an army, he feels a little more invincible because, you know, mm-hmm. how is no one killing this guy? How is no one killing these bastards? <laughs> these but, um, bastards. Would you please kill those bastards? Oh, such God. a great line. But, um, Jonathan oh, Price been... had the best dialogue in that. But, like, I will say, his dialogue. The hell do was... I pay you for? <laughs> oh, what's the one that you. Obviously, the. Um, uh, it's time to rock and ruin that it's one. It's time to but... rock and ruin. I love, what, I love What's the one um... he's like? The, the difference between. Um... Oh, yeah. The, the difference between. Um, in, insanity and genius is measured only by success. Oh, that's such a good line. That is <laughs> he's such got a some good great line. lines. Yeah, yeah, he's um, and you can just tell he's having the most fun making oh, this movie. I think he like, had the most fun out of the entire cast. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think there's. Whereas you, you, you compare it to um, the wall is not enough. Yeah, Bond's like sort of versing like insurmountable odds, but it's just a couple of guys on the submarine, and then you do you throw in the bit with like. His best kill, I think, is um, I Never Miss, when he kills Elektra. Mm-hmm. Um, probably his best mm-hmm. kill, like, Brosnan's best kill ever. Um, and Dude, that's a cold, really... Uh, well, I don't know if it's his coldest kill, but it's definitely the most, like, emotional kill. It's I very think. powerful, and um, yeah. and he plays it very well. And then you jump straight into the submarine. I love that track, the submarine track. Um, when he 
like swan dives into the uh into the pool yeah and then like swims after the submarine it's really oh, really dude, good i i love that line too before he kills renard and he's like she's waiting for you she's, and that's so vicious and unnecessary oh, it is dude so brutal <laughs> even, even I like, love like, it. like um he said something about like he, he's like beating the shit out of bond um uh, he says something about like uh, you'll be dead and he's like haven't you heard so she oh it's like, great yeah he's like, he's like, are you really going to commit suicide for her um, but yeah no so like I just think the stakes of that one are a little more like believable and it, it just kind of has a nice escalation to it although it is funny and I mentioned this um, it is funny that uh, famed naval commander James Bond yes. didn't know yeah. how to make a submarine rise. <laughs> that is a little <laughs> comical, but um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be like cinema sins and ding him for that. Ding him for uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is it is funny though. Like it is. How did Bond not? I mean, maybe he hadn't brushed up on his Russian since the end of the Cold War. <laughs> <or something>. But um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, yeah. no. It, I think in terms of just like a more like sort of focused finale there is definitely more focus going on in the world is not enough but which is funny for a film that it is so know, it's kind of all over the, the place for the most part i think yeah. the, the second act is the problem there because the first act is really focused and you've got like all that stuff with the lecture is really good and then yeah, it's uh, kind of like after the, um after the uh the nuclear base it just kind of um even before that i think it, like the second bond shows up in um i think probably after the ski chase when they show up at her house her manor um, the movie sort of turns into a soap opera for a little bit, uh, which is fine, I guess, but it, it just feels really muddled in terms of the sequence of events, and you, you can tell they're, try, they're trying really hard to sort of throw you off the scent with, ele- with Electra, but they almost do that to, its, to the detriment of the progression of the film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, the re- mm, sorry. Um, it is a cool reveal, but I, yeah, I, I just think they probably could have they probably could have streamlined that middle section of the film a bit because then sure. you get to the second half of the like the, once you get to um, basically after like pipeline sequence on the movie sort of starts to straighten itself out. It's a shame that Christmas Jones is there, but whatever, <laughs> um, I'll live. And it does because of Christmas Jones. I think it does lose focus of the whole Electra like betrayal. It does um, a bit because yeah. Bond is a little less cut by it because he's like, well, I found a new girl, um, but the movie does sort of find its feet a bit more. And then that finale, the, 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 the third act does really bang. So, Oh, it does. Especially that torture sequence, yeah. which is excellent. The torture scene is, is very Fleming, like the, yeah. uh, the, 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 the ornate torture chair. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's very, very cool, but, um, not enough to really push the film over the line for me in terms of, uh, which is better, but right. I, yeah. I think, and, and you know, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like any given day, this could change right now. I think I just appreciated the consistency uh, from a filmmaking standpoint uh, of Tomorrow Never Dies, it was definitely more, like I said, it's tighter, it's focused. David yeah. Arnold's score fucks so hard. Um, not saying that it doesn't fuck hard in the world is not enough, but in Tomorrow Never Dies... And you can buy it now. He's unchanged. <laughs> yeah, you can go buy it, which is great. Not, well, not Tomorrow Never Dies, but... The well, the world's not, not enough. enough. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but well, at least you I can just d- think that yeah. the, once again, the heights that the film reaches in The World Is Not Enough exceed the heights of tomorrow never dies mm. but unfortunately the lows also um you know surpass the the, the lows of of uh tomorrow never dies so it's uh, no a little high, bit more of a mixed bag no high in the world is not enough surpasses money penny making a cunning lingus joke oh Come on. that is so good i love that whole like mission brief in the car I, it's so good samantha bond solidified herself as my favorite money penny in, t- in tomorrow never dies <laughs> yeah she is like as sharp-tongued as any of them oh and it's amazing it's i incredible. think a, a little disappointed a little disappointment that i had with the um the purvis and wade brosnan films is they kind of turn money penny more into like a like the doting kind of secretary again right um, especially in die another day when they had to go through day. that whole like fantasy sequence they had, like, was, like, the like, little, like the little like the little masturbation sequence oh I, um, dude it was so mm, like out awkward, of the blue yeah. and really like, i feel like a betrayal of her character oh she, it was she'd been yeah. introducing golden eyes the kind of like she's the 90s money penny so she's not gonna be like hanging on bonds everywhere she goes and dates and she right she flirts with him because it's fun but it's like it's a little more professional than it had been in past it's a little more like right. sort of one-sided right. um which kind of opened not the gates that, not for that when, Lois maxwell um, was ever like pr- like preyed on but it, it was more of like more 60s in terms of it's obviously in, in terms of its execution right right but, right um, and and i think 
uh, the what Samantha Bond did uh, kind of opened the gate for Naomi Harris uh, in her portrayal of Monty Penny, which is definitely Absolutely. more in yeah. line with that. N- not as not as uh, uh, you know um, snarky, I would say, but definitely yeah. more in the same line. Um, I do want to move uh, on. I, or, say, oh, I just want to say one more thing about like, Samantha Bond. Um, the one thing that bothered me in the world is not enough because and why why I sort of group it in with Dino of the Day, although not as bad is they do kind of do that love triangle with um, the uh, physician and uh, the, the physician and Money Penny, where she's like kind of jealous of her and she gets like a kind of a bitchy comment in about her getting her hands on Bond or something like that. Mm. And um, for me, like that stuff was fine, but like, I don't know, she just seemed a little more like desperate. In that, then she then she had in the previous two in like Maybe. Tomorrow Never Dies and Goldeneye, yeah. she is like so she's in control and yeah she's gonna flirt with Bond, but it's it's more about like almost it's almost like a reversal where it's like Bond wants her a little bit and she's sort of like not letting him have any of it. Yeah, it so is, yeah, yeah. It is. I don't know. I, I think they they did sort of a purpose and way kind of lost that dynamic a little bit. Probably in. Uh, in trying to chase a more traditional Bond Money Penny relationship, but right, whatever. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, but anyways, I think that's the larger discussion between the two films. Although I do have to say, at least we can agree they're not the same film. <laughs> no, they're not. They're they're very. I think they're very distinct. Yeah. They are very distinct. I would agree, and I don't think either of them really get enough credit for what they do. Um, and mm-hmm. especially yeah. Tomorrow Never Dies definitely gets swept under the rug a little bit more. Um, and I think it's unfortunate, but also that film, Dear God, has the greatest Bond song that has ever been written that was not the title Bond song. Oh, um, yeah. No, and that is Surrender. Of course, we were, yeah. And we were talking about this a little bit. Um, it kind of just... It goes back to David Arnold being unchained because that <laughs> song is David Arnold Unchained. The ultimate um, Bond song, yeah. And I think oh we were talking gosh. about that if we could rank literally every song that has been in a Bond film, Surrender would come out on top. Surrender Absolutely. is yeah. the best Bond song ever made. It is criminal that that was not the main title sequence. I get why they did it, but I don't agree with it. Yeah. No, same. And then, actually, if I'm going to criticize Tomorrow Never Dies, because I've been gushing over it a little bit this episode, but if I'm mm-hmm. going to criticize it for one thing, the title song is... Like by Cheryl Crow, not my favorite. Um, I I like the melody a little bit, but not as much as the surrender melody, which is so well woven into the soundtrack. Oh, um, it's gorgeous! It's so gorgeous. Yeah, I I just and I will say, the world is not enough is one of my favorite Bond songs. That is um, one of the, my favorite Bond songs it's, as well. It's fantastic, and I think it was, um, it's kind of remarkable that again we're gonna polish. Uh, polished David Arnold's knob a little bit, but it is remarkable that he managed to write Surrender and then also then follow it up and write yeah. another great Bond song. Like, yeah. he, he's not a one-hit, like a one-hit wonder, not a one-trick no. pony by yeah. any means. It's incredible, um, because then you can go even further and say, look what he did with Casino Royale and when and he then collaborated he went, yeah. with Chris Cornell. Yeah, no, exactly. He, he, he's, like, he's just... An unstoppable machine. He he is and the he, true man behind. Although he has spy. been stopped, unfortunately. Um, yeah, gonna start a petition. That's like the one thing I would probably start a petition for is David Arnold. I, I'm not a big believer in like <laughs> petitioning studios to do things, but I would definitely start a petition for the old uh, DA. Yeah. <laughs> um, I kind of allude to, alluded to it a little bit later on. I think this is gonna be the last thing we talk about. Uh, yeah, Brosnan. Uh, in his remarkably violent nature in the uh, in his tenure as Bond, um, yeah, I think it's just kind of we. I I, you, I think you told me at one point in time that he has the highest kill count out of any of his films. Yeah, um, I think he has the highest kid kill count and also yeah, highest kill count and lowest alcohol consumption. I think. Yeah, which is weirdly means he's enough, just which is a very, maniac. which is the most <laughs> '90s thing I've ever heard. It's like, well, we can't have him drinking or smoking, but he's gonna murder the fuck out of everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, no, uh, it's it's great. I I think his his most brutal kill, obviously, is when he, uh, you know, let's go of Trevelyan, uh, and uh, just drops him into the satellite dish. But the other one is the one in Tomorrow Never Dies where he kills the Doctor. 
He kills Dr. Kaufman. Yeah, yes, that's like a, kills Dr. Kaufman, professional Kaufman, doing a job. Right yeah. in the face. Right in the face. So brutal. And he gets the a great other one, line, I would. The uh, so, yeah. Uh, so am I. And then he pulls the trigger. That's kind of like oh, the uh, for me line, just not as um, emotional. Yeah, I know for sure. I actually just pulled up the um, the stats here on the bonds. Uh, I, well, it's not really the stats. It's more just like sort of a, a, a pie chart. But um, yeah, so it looks like Daniel Craig is the most alcoholic bond, which I probably could have told you anyway. I could have told you that um, based off of Casino Royale alone. <laughs> yeah, the man drinks himself under the table, followed by... Um, Timothy Dalton. <laughs> he <laughs> really tapped it away in his two <laughs> films. He like chugged, which I think honestly makes him the most alcoholic Bond because he only how, had two films. Yeah, he had two films and he still out drank. Um, basically everyone was. Weirdly enough, Roger Moore drank the least. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me though. That doesn't surprise me. And he also um, but he uh, who, okay. I mean, Lazenby has like a bit of a curve because he did sleep with a lot of people. I think he slept with the most, followed by Roger Moore, which makes a lot of sense. Lazenby uh, did? A, I mean, Lazenby kind of only had one film and he just slept with everyone in it. He but, really um, did. Um, uh, I think this is proportional, though. I don't think this is like like based on numbers. No, yeah, per se. yeah. I think it's sure. per, per film or something, like the average per film. But yeah, Brosnan by far and away murders the most. <laughs> um. And it makes sense because he loves machine guns. He oh, finds he a way to get a machine loves- gun in every film. I think my favorite one is, is I think at the beginning of Tomorrow Never Dies where he has that sick leather jacket on, let me just say. Oh, my favorite the, the, the little, where he's like, the little, shooting like, the, the machine gun. Yeah. The sweeping shot that's sort of almost the Michael Bay shot that like yeah. sweeps around as he's like yes. firing the gun. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Oh, it's so good. No, I agree. It's... um. Brosnan is a fucking maniac in these films. He just loves killing people. Um, Dude, he's insane, and like, and he does it with with such like a um, like exceptional brutality. I think it gets lost because he is wedged between the two most like brooding violent bonds. Oh, absolutely! Um, and because when he's Craig. killing, when he's killing people, he's like doing it in such a cool way. Like we were, like you were saying this, he's dashing with a bit of danger. That was your dashing description with a, yeah, of, of Pierce Brosnan, one. and um. The man. thing I want to say about Pierce Brosnan, because for me, he is my third favorite Bond. It goes Daniel Craig, Sean Connery, and then Pierce Brosnan. Um, mm. I know he gets a lot of flack. I don't think he gets enough credit for what he does. Um, and people kind of, they judge him more by the films than they do his actual performance. For man. sure, which is a natural, a natural inclination. It's a natural yeah, inclination, that. absolutely. Um, that's why... Uh, people don't usually rank Timothy Dalton high unless they're really hardcore Bond people. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think that Pierce Brosnan loved playing James Bond only second to Roger Moore. Roger Moore obviously loved the character, loved the franchise so much, but I, I think Pierce Brosnan really, really just had a blast with it, and you can see it come through in his performance. And the thing that I love is that in every single outing, he got better and better. I mean, we've said multiple times we think his best performance is in Die Another Day, which is nuts, but... Um, yeah. That is nuts. Like the it, fact that he it, it managed really, to prof- outshine the, the the insanity that he was involved in. <laughs> yeah, no, it, exactly. It's it's just one of those things where he um he constantly cared. He had a great time playing the character and whatnot. And I I have always just I mean you know maybe it's because I, we were born in the '90s and we grew up with him. But I, I was telling playing, you yeah. like. He was, I legitimately, when I was a, when I was a very young kid, I legitimately thought he was the only person who have ever played James Bond until I discovered the, the Connery films and the Moore films and Dalton and all that stuff like that. But it was like, he was just that staple, um, for, for the franchise, I I guess just growing up. And he's, he's also easily the best Bond to have been featured in a video game. Like he is the video game, James Bond. He's the, he's the video game Bond. And that's the thing. Like I, cause like, like you were saying, I grew up with Pierce Brosnan. Because of the games, because of the movies coming out when we were kids, yeah. like it is just one of those things. Um, I think he does get a little flack for being kind of an amalgam Bond, where he does take, uh, like you know, the Sean Connery edge and the Sean Connery like suaveness, and then mixes it a bit with a bit of the Roger Moore like sort of tongue in cheek. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in that sense, he does sort of feel like a mixture of those two Bonds rather than his own thing. But I 
do, I don't think that means he didn't bring his own stuff to the role. I think you see um, a lot of his own flair in that role. Yeah, I think he sort of found his like, as time went on, he really did find his um his footing to the point where once you reach Dying of the Day, you don't think of him. As, I, I was reading through some old uh, Roger Ebert reviews. Uh, Roger Ebert's a man I uh, greatly admire. And I was curious what his takes were on the Brosnan Bond films. And he was surprisingly very much like in the same place we are where like he was, he understood what they were going for and he appreciated them for what they were. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, he said in his Die Another Day a review that there was, during the opening scene, the second Bond like uh, takes the sunglasses from the, from the, the mercenary guy that he's yeah. like, impersonating um, and sort of grins. And he said, that that was the moment where he sort of realized, oh, I'm not thinking about Sean Connery or Roger Moore or anyone else at the like, right now. Like, I'm not comparing Pierce to these people anymore. He is Bond, and mm-hmm. he sort of transcends comparison at a certain point. And I think yeah. that is something that people seem to forget. Like, he is, for a lot of people, he is Bond, um, yeah. and he always will be. And I think he, he, he has gotten a bit of a shellacking in the last couple of years, I think in comparison to Craig, um, and just because Craig is so exceptional, and, and his and his films have been so exceptional, yeah, yeah. completely turned the franchise and character around. I mean, so like all of the praise that Craig gets is so deserved. It's just that, man, I, I, I those those bras and films for his, for all the faults they had, they are so much fun. They are. They're, they're really they're very American Bond films. I feel. Yes, uh, they're they the American are. Bond films, and I think like they it's are. very much it plays into the nineties. Yeah. Um, a lot, but yeah, I think because they they had that like action mo- action movie like veneer, like really rubbed on thick. But yeah. it's it's got its own charm, and they're not devoid of of class in a way that a lot of films of the of that era kind of are. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, Pierce Brosnan, what a guy, what a guy. <laughs> what a Love man. to have him on the show one time. So oh, Pierce, boy. if you're listening, invites always open because he's oh, totally boy. listening to the show. But anyways, guys, it, I think that hours. is a great <laughs> way to conclude this episode. It's got it's a little over two hours, so you got a lot of information thrown at you. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed it. Be sure to let us know. While, so. Yeah, exactly. So we got to because you haven't heard from us in like three months or so. We got to give you a jam packed episode, and hopefully, we did that. Um, be sure to follow the words are not enough Twitter account, which is just T W A N E Pod. Uh, Brody is going to be managing that account, putting up a bunch of polls and we're going to be taking that into consideration when we do uh episodes like this because i love this discussion and i think we're going to start doing more and more of these um i think the next episode we do is going to be kind of like a bond christmas wish wish list or a bond holiday wish list correct uh yeah i think so that's what we something had, along like, those discussed. lines so, yeah maybe. So, who knows maybe so, so you're gonna get unless, another episode from us unless uh, um, mr fukunaga summer. gives us a christmas present and of course he we gives have us to a trailer. cover that <laughs> Right, no, oh, God, he gives like, us a trailer, a trailer for a film he's never shot. Footage shot. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, but anyways, guys, Stitch be together sure. with other films. Exactly, exactly. Oh, um, be sure to go follow the Words Are Not Enough Twitter account. It's uh, Brody's putting out a lot of great content there, so it's 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 fun stuff. But uh, be sure best. to let us know your thoughts and opinions on the Brosnan era and uh, Die Another Day, ver- or not Die Another Day, uh, Tomorrow Never <laughs> Dies versus The World Is Not Enough. I know we already had the poll, but it's always great to hear from you also. Let us know in the comments yeah, section. Yeah, us. Uh, tweet at us, yeah. Let us know in the comment section of wherever you are listening to this show. Um, Mr. Brody Saravelli, where can everyone find you? Well, yeah, other than at the uh, at the Twain account, you can follow me at Brody Saravelli. Uh, that'll be in the description if that name's a bit of a tongue twister for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, lots of really great content let me just say <laughs> he's got his he's got a schedule just, let me just plug myself no it's um yeah more bond centric content on the twain account and then more everything else like just random movie and political stuff if you uh if you dare to listen to what i have to say about that stuff Absolutely. on the regular account so Feel free. <laughs> there you go, guys. And as always, be sure to like this video if you're watching it on YouTube. Or if you're listening to us on iTunes, please give this vi- this uh, episode a rating. Give the show a rating, a review. It really helps out the show. It helps us get noticed. Um, it really helps in the feedback. And uh, if you hate what we're doing, also let us know in the <laughs> comments section or in the reviews because we... 
we look at all of it. Um, but you can always like Men vs. Movies on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, uh, simply by searching Men vs. Movies. And lastly, guys, if you like me specifically and you like what I have to say, you can always give me a follow on Twitter at Griff Schiller. All right, that's going to do it for episode number 18 of The Words Are Not Enough. And until next time, take care. Take care.